Chapter 141, Arrival of Delegations. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon, slash com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan Liu. When the students came down for breakfast on the morning of the 30th of October, they found that the great dining hall had been decorated overnight. Huge silk banners hung on the walls, each representing a Hogwarts house, red with a gold lion for Gryffindor, blue with a bronze eagle for Ravenclaw, yellow with a black badger for Hufflepuff, and green with a silver snake for Slytherin. Behind the teacher's head table was the most prominent banner of all, the Hogwarts banner. A lion, eagle, badger, and snake joined together by a large letter H. There was a pleasant feeling of anticipation in the air. Nobody, professors included, was very attentive in lessons, being much more interested in the arrival of the people from Bobatons and Durmstrang that evening. Even the students who had potions found it more bearable than usual, as Snape was quieter than usual. The bell rang early, and the entire student body went to their dormitories, deposited their bags and books as they had been instructed, pulled on their cloaks, and rushed back downstairs to the great hall. Each head of house was ordering their students to sit. Sit down, children, shouted Flitwitch with his squeaky voice. At that moment, it held a lot of power. Remain in your seats and don't move around. You can do whatever you want after, but right now, I want discipline. Carmichael, get down from the table and sit on the bench. The squeaky yell almost made Eddie fall from the table. He stumbled around as he rushed to sit back on the bench. Miss Lovegood, please remove that dragon hat from your head, sighed Flitwick. Yes. Yes, I know you want to represent the school. Right now, you need to sit down like a good student. Yes, thank you. You know what? Please give me that hat. I will return it to you after the feast. He took the headwear that had the shape of a dragon from Luna, shrinking it down so he could pocket it. Mr. Belby, if I see your hands moving towards your mouth, if I see you chewing, swallowing, or eating anything in general— I'll deprive you of your sense of taste and smell for an entire week. Put that candy down and clean the table. Don't try your chances. It won't go well. The threat caused the table to be cleaned faster than what any house elf could ever accomplish. Within seconds, the candy pack disappeared and the table was sparkling clean. Prefects, called out the half-goblin, half-human professor. Follow me, please. It's time. See you guys in a bit said Quinn smiling to his friends, who all had been reprimanded by Flitwick. The prefects, the head boy and girl, every head of house, and Dumbledore came down the steps and lined up in front of the castle. It was a cool, clear evening, twilight was peeking over the horizon, and a pale, translucent moon was already shining over the forbidden forest. Quinn stood with the Ravenclaw's prefects, and as prescribed, he took his place at the front with the fifth-year prefects, just behind the headmasters and the faculty. They were watching excitingly the darkening grounds, but nothing was moving yet. Everything was still, silent, and quiet as usual. The students started to feel cold. They wished the delegation would hurry up. Maybe the foreign students were preparing a dramatic entrance. There was a tendency among the magical kind to show off when gathering in groups. Quinn, too, wanted them to hurry up. He was comfortable in the cold, but he wasn't okay with boredom. Standing there doing nothing wasn't his style. He couldn't take out a book to read because Flitwick would yell at him, and he couldn't mess with magic because... Flitwick would yell at him. Suddenly, Dumbledore called out from the back row where he was standing with the other teachers. Aha, unless I am mistaken, the delegation from Bobiton's approaches. Where are they? asked a sixth-year Hufflepuff prefect, looking eagerly in various directions. There, said the head boy, pointing over the forest. Something large, much larger than a broomstick, or perhaps a hundred broomsticks, was hurtling across the deep blue sky toward the castle, growing larger. It's a dragon, shrieked one of the Gryffindors. Don't be stupid. It's a flying house, said a Slytherin. The Slytherin's guess was closer. As the gigantic black shape skimmed over the treetops of the forbidden forest, and the lights that shone from the castle windows lit the shape up, they saw a massive, powder-blue, horse-drawn carriage the size of a large house soaring toward them. The carriage was flying thanks to a dozen Abraxan-winged horses, each the size of an elephant. 
The Hogwarts professors drew backward as the carriage hurtled ever lower, coming in to land at a tremendous speed. Then, with an almighty crash that made Flitwick jump back onto Snape's foot, the horse's hooves, wider than dinner plates, hit the ground. A second later, the carriage landed too, bouncing upon its vast wheels, while the golden horses tossed their enormous heads and rolled large, fiery red eyes. Elephantine Palomino, a Braxen winged horses, noted Quinn. He had just the time to see that the carriage door bore a coat of arms, two crossed, golden wands, each emitting three stars. Before it opened, a boy in pale blue robes jumped down from the carriage, bent forward, fumbled for a moment with something on the carriage floor, and unfolded a set of golden steps. He sprang back respectfully. Then they saw a shining, high-heeled black shoe emerging from the inside of the carriage, a shoe the size of a child's sled, followed, almost immediately, by the largest woman he had ever seen in his life. The enormous size of the carriage and the horses was immediately explained. A few people gasped. Lotz had only ever seen one person as large as this woman in his life, and that was the gamekeeper and care of magical creatures Hagrid, and they doubted whether there was an inch difference in their heights. Yet somehow, maybe simply because they were used to Hagrid, this woman, she was on the ground now, seemed even more unnaturally large. As she stepped into the light coming from the entrance hall, she was revealed to have a handsome, olive-skinned face, large, black, liquid-looking eyes, and a rather beaky nose. Her hair was drawn back in a shining knob at the base of her neck. She was dressed from head to foot in black satin, and many magnificent opals gleamed at her throat and on her thick fingers. Quinn and Dumbledore started to clap. Following their lead, the others broke into applause too, a few of them craning their necks to get a better look at this woman. Her face relaxed into a gracious smile. She walked towards Dumbledore, extending a glittering hand. Dumbledore, though tall himself, and barely bent to kiss it. My dear Madame Maxime, said Dumbledore, welcome to Hogwarts. Dumbly door, said Madame Maxime in a deep voice. I hope you're well. Excellent as always. Thank you, he said. My pupils, said Madame Maxime, waving one of her enormous hands carelessly behind her. Quinn, whose attention had been focused entirely upon Madame Maxime, now noticed there were about a dozen boys and girls in their late teens. They emerged from the carriage and were standing behind Madame Maxime. They were shivering, which was unsurprising, given that their robes seemed to be made of fine silk, and none of them were wearing cloaks. A few had wrapped scarves and shawls around their heads. From what Quinn could see, they were standing in Madame Maxime's enormous shadow. They were staring up at Hogwarts with apprehensive looks on their faces. Has Karkaroff arrived yet? Madame Maxime asked. He should be here any moment, said Dumbledore. Would you like to wait here and greet him, or would you prefer to step inside and warm up a bit? Warm up, I think, said Madame Maxime in accented English. But the horses, I believe, our care of magical creatures teacher will be delighted to take care of them, said Dumbledore. He'll take care of the horses when he finishes dealing with a situation he has with other, er, of his charges. Scroots, supplied Sprout. My steeds require forceful handling, said Madame Maxime, looking as though she doubted that any care of magical creatures teacher at Hogwarts could be up to the job. They are very strong. I assure you that Hagrid will be well up to the job, said Dumbledore, smiling. Very well, said Madame Maxime, bowing slightly. Would you please inform Hagrid that the horses drink only single malt whiskey? I shall inform him, said Dumbledore, also bowing. One of our students will escort you inside. McGonagall turned towards the Ravenclaw group and spoke. Mr. West, please escort the Bobatons delegation into the castle. Yes, Professor, said Quinn and stepped out of the group towards the French delegation. Bonsoir, said Quinn with a smile. He continued to speak in French. Please follow me. I will lead you to the castle. The sudden fluent French from a Hogwarts student surprised the Bobatons group, but they didn't have time to react as Quinn turned and started to walk. They could only exchange looks and follow him. Thank you for traveling all this way. I'm sure it wasn't an easy journey, said Quinn as he took out his fake wand and pointed it up while casting magic. The Bobaton students suddenly felt the cold leave as warmth enveloped them. Your French is excellent, said Maxine, 
looking at Quinn with interest. Thank you for the compliment, ma'am, smiled Quinn as the group climbed up the stairs to the entrance hall. My grandmother was French. I have been taught the language since I was young. The group entered the hall, and the surroundings were illuminated by the light in the hall. As he was requested, Quinn stopped in the middle of the hall and turned towards the Beau Batons group. We will enter the hall when the Durmstrang delegation arrives, informed Quinn. Until then, please make yourselves comfortable, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me questions. I will try my best to answer all of your queries. What is your name, child? asked Maxine. Looking down from her towering height, there was a look in her eyes. Oh my, how forgetful of me, he said and, with a smile, introduced himself. My name is Quinn. I'm a fifth-year student here at Hogwarts. Maximi continued to look at Quinn for a few seconds. You are a West, aren't you? Quinn held the twitch in his eye and a click in his tongue. While he never hid his name from anyone in Hogwarts, he never had wanted anyone to know his real background. It was convenient that not a lot of people knew about the Wests. Besides, he only bothered to interact with people whom he got along with, such as the Greengrass sisters, the Potter twins, or the faculty. He didn't try to get close to others who he didn't like, for instance, Draco Malfoy. To him, it would be tremendously annoying if people realized his family background. Bugs would start to wander around, trying to please him because of his family wealth. To his luck, his background had been able to remain mostly anonymous. He had, for a reason, not given his family name to a limp Maxime. What gave it away? asked Quinn. Your eyes, little one, answered Maxime. Your sister has the same eyes as you. And child, you remind me too much of George West. You know I was disappointed when I got your rejection letter. I wish you had attended Bobatons instead of Hogwarts. I'm sure I would have loved it, spoke Quinn. The conversation ended there. Quinn looked over towards the students and saw them looking towards him. He smiled and initiated a conversation. Hello, how are you all? Are you excited about your being in Hogwarts? One of the Bobatons boys nodded with a friendly smile. Yes, it will be a unique experience, I'm sure. Are all of you going to enter your names for the tournament? Yes, we went through a C lection process. The 15 of us have been selected as champion candidates, said the late teen, proud of himself. The rest, too, held some level of proud expressions. Well, congratulations for being the best, said Quinn. As I said, if you have any questions, I'll always be there. If you have any problems that you need to solve, feel free to contact me. After saying that, Quinn took out a thin stack of French AID cards and handed them one card each. These cards have a map that will lead you to my office, he said, and the Bobotan students saw a small square with an arrow pointing towards a direction. If you follow the arrow, you'll arrive somewhere where you'll have solutions to all of your problems. Quinn got to the last student. He looked at the girl in front of him. Beautiful was the first thing Quinn thought. She was tall and willowy, with an air of grace that made her seem like she was a princess in an ivory palace. Her very presence seemed to emanate a faint, silvery glow. She had long, silvery blonde hair that fell almost to her waist. She had shining, deep blue eyes, fair skin, and very white, even teeth. All about the girl in front of him was breathtakingly beautiful. Quinn immediately knew who she was, but as he handed her the card, he asked, May I know your name? The question brought smiles to a few Bobotan students, while others didn't look so happy. They knew what was happening, and to some it was amusing, but to others it wasn't, because they didn't want to be in Quinn's place when everything ended. The girl grasped the card with her dainty gloved hand, and with a smile that screamed pride, self-confidence, haughtiness, and a sense of superiority. She introduced herself. Fleur Delacour. Quinn nodded, and with the card out of his hand, he walked away without any further words. The sudden leave stunned Fleur, and her eyes followed Quinn with a surprised expression. Beau students were also rendered stunned as they were expecting a completely opposite reaction. Maxime, too, looked at Quinn with interest in her eyes, although her expression betrayed nothing. So that's how it feels, huh? thought Quinn as he walked. Vilas and their allure can be dangerous. Aha, uh -huh. yes they are. The second he laid his eyes on her, he realized what an absolute beauty Fleur Delacour was. 
She was at the level that she would be able to turn a hundred out of a hundred heads when passing by. But when he stood face to face, the French villa transcended all levels of beauty that Quinn had ever witnessed. Quinn had felt his heart quicken just a notch. His pupils dilated as if he couldn't take his eyes off her. The allure washed over him, doing what it did best, enhancing her natural beauty to an enchanting level. But then, his magic kicked in. It felt the foreign magic recognized the effects, and finally, the will be had honed through cold, pain, suffering, and turbulent waters took care of it. Even without her villa allure, Fleur was an absolute beauty, nevertheless, not on a level that Quinn would turn into a blubbering fool. It seems the Durmstrang delegation is here, said Quinn, turning the Beau Baton's delegation's eyes away from him towards the hall's entrance. They saw Dumbledore walk in with a tall and thin, white-haired man with a goatee that finished in a slight curl. Behind them were the head of houses, Hogwarts students, and around a dozen Durmstrang students dressed in some shaggy, matted fur cloaks. Madame Maxime, it has been a long time since our last meeting, smiled the man who led the Durmstrang students, but his smile did not extend to his eyes, which remained cold and shrewd. Karkaroff, nodded Maxime. She didn't return the smile. She didn't like the Durmstrang headmaster and had no desire to hide that behind a fake, polite smile. We should hurry and move inside. I'm sure all students are starving and would like to enjoy a hot meal, said Dumbledore, but from the looks of it, he was only speaking to the Hogwarts group. McGonagall walked towards Quinn. She took him a step away from everyone else. Mr. West, please coordinate the delegation's entrance. Allow them entry only when you hear the headmaster introduce them. Yes, Professor. I will make sure that everything will be seamless. The Hogwarts professor and the Hogwarts students moved to the Great Hall from a side entrance, leaving behind the Bobitons and Durmstrang delegation alone in a tense silence. Maxime and Karkaroff ignored each other and talked to their students about how they had to enter. If I may get everybody's attention, called out Quinn, clear and loud, breaking their talks and bringing all pairs of eyes on him. He retrieved what looked like a black earbud from his pocket and plugged it in his right ear. Inside, Headmaster Dumbledore will be introducing your entry to the students. The moment he'll utter your name will be the moment you will have to enter he pointed at the massive gate, that massive gate to the Great Hall. I will be coordinating the operation, so when I give you the signal, please move in immediately and showcase the show of magic you have prepared, said Quinn. Both delegations wanted to make a strong impression on the Hogwarts students. Besides, magicals loved to show off, so they had prepared coordinated magic performances to accomplish that. Bobatons will enter first, followed by Durmstrang, notified Quinn, and then looked at Bobatons. He told them to get ready. After giving them instructions, Quinn tapped an earbud in his ear. Inside the Great Hall, Dumbledore was standing behind a podium as he addressed the students. If one looked closely on that podium's front side, one would see a small, square metallic chip that was stuck to the podium's front. After Quinn tapped his earbud, the chip shone in a short blue glow. Outside, the earbuds came to life, and the sound of Dumbledore's voice filled Quinn's ears. He had been inspired by the Weasley's extendable ears to create his own listening device. The difference between his and Weasley's creation was that his design had been based on non-magical earbuds. His were wireless, meaning they weren't inhibited by the length of a string, and thus had a greater range. Quinn had designed a transmission system that could transfer Magifax documents across the globe, so creating a wireless sound receiver that could transfer voice across the Great Hall wasn't that much of a challenge. His only limit was the size, as it didn't allow him to etch many runes on a square chip and an earbud. The range was barely passable by Quinn's high standards. Excuse me. Quinn turned while keeping an ear on what Dumbledore was speaking. Yes, Miss Delacour, how may I help you? Why does the headmistress know you? she asked and while she was interested in her question, actually, she wanted to have another go against Quinn. Ah, she's amped it up, huh? Quinn could feel a wave of magic rush around him, but affected him as much as one did when pushing a mountain with their hands. That is, nothing at all. My sister studied at Bobaton's, and she is also one of Bobaton's most prominent alumni recruiters. 
That's the reason why headmistress Maxime knows of me. You might know of her. She gives an annual talk at your school. Her name is Leah West, he answered with a polite smile. Fleur, of course, recalled Leah West. All final year students who wanted to work or pursue an apprenticeship would have to know Leah West, as she was the most prominent recruiter sponsor at Bobatons. Nonetheless, she wasn't satisfied after she noticed Quinn didn't show any reaction to her shooting allure. Why? she began, but Quinn cut her off. Miss Delacour, I would be happy to talk more, but I'm afraid it will be after the introductions. Our headmaster is about to introduce Bobatons. Please join your group. Fleur wanted to speak something, but Maxime called her back to the group. Quinn walked to the door as the Bobatons group moved closer. He looked at them and then counted down from ten before opening the door. It was time for the Bobato, NS delegation to meet the rest of the school. Quinn West, M.C., busy performing his prefect duties. Phileas Flitwick, professor, stressed like other professors. Olymp Maxime, half-giantess, nose of the West family. Fleur Delacour, Vila, interested in the boy. Alan L., shipping Fleur X. Quinn hard. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 142, Performance and Goblet of Fire. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at h slash wyon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. What followed after was similar to the movie version, Bobton's delegation put on a magical performance. The only difference was that Bobton's was co-ed instead of an all-girls school. Durmstrang delegation, please be ready. The Bobton's delegation is almost over. Notified Quinn to the gruff-looking boys and girls of Durmstrang and their posh-looking headmaster. Karkaroff raised his hand, and immediately the Durmstrang students got into two lines, both lines a mix of boys and girls, each of them separated by the other gender. I wonder if this is how all of Durmstrang students act, thought Quinn. He wondered whether Karkaroff could control a school whose students were only from pure-blood families and where pure-blood dogma was a substantial part of their culture. Quinn's eyes, then, found a well-built late teen who was leading the left row. Victor Crum was thin, had dark hair, and sallow-skinned, with a large curved nose and thick black eyebrows. He looked like an overgrown bird of prey. It was hard to believe he was only 18. The future champion looked surly, moody, and a bit grumpy. Crum didn't look very enthusiastic about the show of magic that was about to happen. It made Quinn think about Crum's personality from the original works, reserved and not fond of the attention he garnered due to his celebrity status. If Quinn was honest, he was quite interested in the Durmstrang students. Out of the three schools, Durmstrang students were the ones who shared closer affinity with him. They practiced the dark arts just like him, and the school didn't exclude those magics from their studies. To Quinn, in some way, Durmstrang was a more complete school of magic than either Hogwarts or Bosebatons. His thoughts wandered to the most well-known fact about the school. Durmstrang, the school where Jellert Grindelwald studied, huh? Bosebatons' performance is over, notified Quinn. He placed his hand on the door while listening through his earbud. Dumbledore was praising Bo Bottons' performance. He then moved on to the introduction of Durmstrang. Quinn once again started the countdown. At one, he pushed the door. Durmstrang's delegation entered the Great Hall and immediately started the performance with a show of fire. He stood in front of the Great Hall door, and a peculiar thought about this entire ceremony entered his mind. Three schools, three heads, technically three champions, three representatives, so three should continue, shouldn't it? A scenario morphed into his mind as he continued to hear the faint ooh-ahs from the Hogwarts students through his earbud. When Durmstrang's performance ended and Dumbledore took the podium again, Quinn finished his plan and took his fake wand into his hand. Inside the Great Hall, Dumbledore watched the students of two schools sitting together with his own students, and it brought a smile to his face thinking about the new experience they would have. I would like to thank Bobatones and Durmstrang for those exhilarating performances. They have been an absolute delight to experience. With great pleasure, 
we welcome you to Hogwarts. I hope and trust that your stay here will be both comfortable and enjoyable. The tournament will be officially opened at the end of the feast. Now, I'd like to invite you to. Dumbledore was about to open the feast, but his words stopped when he himself and everybody in the Great Hall saw silk banners hanging from the walls, each of them representing a Hogwarts house. A gold lion, a bronze eagle, a black badger, and a silver serpent shiver and shake. The animals started to shimmer with dazzling lights. The banners started to sway as if they were moved by a light wind. The sudden change in the banners caused everyone to quiet down. Just before the hustle-bustle returned in the form of whispers, A, N, D, talks, the green banner with the silver serpent glowed brighter before a shimmering green serpent silhouette burst out from the banner. The serpent silhouette didn't have any defined features and was wholly made from solid shades of green. It slithered around in the air above everyone's heads. After circling the hall, the serpentine form emitted a deep hiss, and the silhouette moved over the Slytherin table, its lower body curling with its head standing tall. The Slytherin students exclaimed and cheered when the serpent that stood above them majestically. But their cheers subsided when the red banner with the gold lion similarly shimmered with a red lion silhouette walked out with its four legs stepping on air. The featureless lion face made up from solid reddish hues seemed to alert the green serpent. With its tail swinging gently, the lion stood above the Gryffindor table. Then, the lion figure seemed to tense its body as a fierce roar shook the hall. The Gryffindor table exploded in cheers as their house animal roared against the green serpent. After the roar subsided, the lion stood tall with its head raised in pride. Just when it looked like the lion and serpent were going to fight, the yellow banner of the black Hufflepuff badger on the banners glowed harshly, and a yellow badger form stepped out with clawed paws and a short tail behind its back. The low-pitched growl from the badger stopped the lion and serpent from jumping at each other. The Hufflepuff students, like the other two tables, also cheered for their mascot animal. The badger silhouette seemed to be pleased that the threat he posed had stopped the two other figures. The three figures now looked at each other in warning, and with slight movements, they stood equidistant to each other. By now, everyone knew what would happen, and they eyed the Ravenclaw banner. The Ravenclaw students were looking at their flag in heightened excitement. Even the three animal forms had their eyes on the blue banner. As everyone expected, the banner shimmered, and a blue eagle flew out of the bronze. Unlike the other three animals, the eagle was fast and unlike them, small. The eagle flew high above the charmed hovering candles of the Great Hall. As everyone watched, a shrill shriek pierced everyone to their core, and they noticed the eagle growing larger till it was the same size as the other three. What had started as a normal-sized eagle was now a majestic creature of prey. It flapped its wings and glided above the Ravenclaw table. It then shrieked for the Ravenclaw table to be backed by loud cheers from the students of the wittiest house. The four creatures stood above their tables in a square formation, and just when everyone thought they were going to fight, the four animal figures started to shine brightly in green, red, yellow, and blue. Their forms started to change. The green serpent turned into a bald man in a long robe holding a long staff. The man was standing straight and, even though it had no features, he struck a cunning figure. The red lion with a short roar morphed into a man with a bear belly, and, as the human became complete, it took out a great sword, and with two hands on the hilt, the sword tip was slammed down to the ground with a loud ting. The badger stood up on its two hind feet and began the transformation into a figure of a homely woman with a round and plump figure dressed in a dress. She crossed her arms, and in one of her hands was a darker yellow outline of a wand. Then, with a fierce flap of its wings, the blue eagle turned into a tall woman, dressed in flowing robes with wide sleeves. She had a book in her right hand. In the other, she twirled a dark blue wand. Whereas the students and teachers alike had been dazed by what was happening, the four house ghosts, including the bloody baron, had all come to the great hall for this event. Of the four house ghosts, except the Gryffindor ghost, Nicholas de Mimsy Porpington, three had had strong connections to the figures. Friar, 
the Hufflepuff ghost looked at the yellow figure. His eye as started tearing up with the memories he suddenly remembered of his childhood. A throaty whisper escaped him. Oh, Helga. He looked at the matronly lady, which couldn't be anyone other than his own teacher and mentor, Helga Hufflepuff. Helena Ravenclaw, the Ravenclaw ghost, stilled as she stared at the blue outline. Emotions from her mortal life flooded her ghostly mind. The feelings she had become numbed to came back in full force, and the regret of not meeting her mother at her deathbed brought tears to her ghostly eyes. She wanted to go away, but her ethereal body didn't move. She could only continue to stare at the blue silhouette of Rowena Ravenclaw. The bloody Baron, the recluse Slytherin ghost, stared at the familiar figure of the man who had taught him the magical arts. The man who had tried to teach him the importance of restraint and not to let his violent, uncontrolled anger take the best of him. Nevertheless, he had ignored the man's teachings. If he had just listened to his mentor, the Baron wouldn't have become bloody. The noble Baron, after a millennium, bowed to the figure of his mentor, Salazar Slytherin. The final red figure, the fourth founder, Godric Gryffindor, raised his wand to the sky while tapping his sword down. In his life, he had had a versatile mindset as he chose to wield a sword as well as a wand, making him a rather dynamic man who deferred the dueling style to his opponent, were they magicals or non-magicals. Following his lead, the other three founders raised their staff slash wands. Four beams of lights, green, red, yellow, and blue, zapped out into the center of the Great Hall. Then, everyone began to see a structure start to build itself, and before they knew it, a scaled-down Hogwarts castle was standing in the sky. The four figures turned into orbs of shining light and flew towards the castle for it to glow in a bright flash, almost blinding everyone, causing many to shield their eyes. When it subsided, they saw a burning coat of arms with the Gryffindor lion, the Slytherin serpent, the Ravenclaw eagle, and the Hufflepuff badger, all circling the letter H. And below the coat arms, it could be seen the motto, Draco Dormians Nunquam Titillandus, in an S-scroll beneath the shield. Welcome to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. A voice reached everyone in the hall, and with it, the entire student body of Hogwarts got up from their seats with loud cheers, claps filled with the hall, and fists were pumped up. The applause was so loud that one would have heard it from outside. The applause startled various creatures, such as owls, roosters, and pigs, among other animals that lived in Hogwarts grounds. Among all the commotion and cheering, the professors seated on the head table tried to find the one who had cast the magic, while the few who weren't trying to calm the students down had their eyes attracted towards the hall entrance. There, they saw a familiar figure decked in Hogwarts robes with blue trims, pocketing a wand into his clothes. He seemed to notice their gaze as he looked up at them with his stone gray eyes. A smile bloomed on his face as he bowed to them, and, as if it was a performance ending, the burning coat of arms in the air above blew up with a sound and turned into golden glitter dust, raining down on everybody, but disappeared before anyone could touch them. Hogwarts had been appropriately represented, and it had been represented with style. I'm back, said Quinn. He sat down on the seat saved for him by his friends. You're too late. Merlin's ball, started Eddie, but was cut off when Marcus gave him a tight kick to the shin with a glare. Eddie secretly glanced at Luna and changed his words. Merlin's beard, that was bloody marvelous. I saw some of it, and you're right. That was sublime, chuckled Quinn. He didn't want to reveal the fact that it had been him behind the demonstration. The golden dust was pretty. I think it was pixie dust, said Luna, her eyes shining in curiosity and excitement. Quinn smiled and looked around. He heard the praises from his demonstration and felt the excitement in the air. The talk about the Triwizard had been left out. The entire hall was filled with gossip about his work. He looked at the Slytherin table and the Durmstrang students, who were excitedly looking at each other, a stark contrast from their previous looks. Quinn leaned back to take a glance ahead at the Ravenclaw table. He saw Bo Batten's students excitedly talking with each other. Some of them were even interacting with other Ravenclaw students. All right, international relations are secured, muttered Quinn before the feast started, and with plates in front of them filled with food. 
The house elves in the kitchen seemed to have pulled out all the stops. There was a greater variety of dishes in front of them than Quinn had ever seen at Hogwarts, including several that were foreign. The Great Hall seemed somehow much more crowded than usual, even though there were barely 30 additional students there. Perhaps it had been because their differently colored uniforms stood out so clearly against the black of the Hogwarts robes. Now that they had removed their furs, the Durmstrang students were revealed to be wearing deep blood-red robes, while Bobatons sported their blue robes. Hagrid sidled into the hall through a door behind the staff table, twenty minutes after the start of the feast. His hands were covered with bandages. The horses must have been vicious, thought Quinn as Hagrid passed by. Once the golden plates had been wiped clean, Dumbledore stood up again. A pleasant sort of tension seemed to fill the hall now. Everyone felt a slight thrill of excitement, wondering what was coming. The moment has come, said Dumbledore, smiling around at the sea of upturned faces. The Triwizard Tournament is about to start. I would like to say a few words before we bring in the casket. The what? Eddie muttered. Marcus shrugged. Just to clarify the procedure that we will be following this year. First, though, let me introduce, for those who do not know him, Mr. Bartamius Crouch, head of the Department of International Magical Cooperation. There was a smattering of polite applause. And Mr. Ludo Bagman, head of the Department of Magical Games and Sports. There was a much louder round of applause for Bagman than for Crouch. Perhaps because of his fame as a beater, or simply because he looked so much more likable. He acknowledged it with a cheery wave of his hand. Bartimius Crouch did not smile or wave when his name was announced. Quinn, on the other hand, clapped more actively for Bartimius Crouch Sr. The man was a wartime leader who had legalized for Aurors the use of unforgivable curses against the Death Eaters. Sure, he had helped his son escape Azkaban, but Quinn knew that positive things shouldn't be ignored in the face of the negative and vice versa. Speaking of the son, what's Junior doing? thought Quinn. He looked at the poly-juiced Barty Crouch Jr. to see that Alastair Moody was looking at Dumbledore with his normal eye. His magical eye, though, was definitely locked onto his father. Mr. Bagman and Mr. Crouch have worked tirelessly over the last few months to arrange the Triwizard Tournament. Dumbledore continued. They will be joining Professor Karkaroff, Madame Maxime, and myself on the panel that will judge the champion's efforts. At the mention of the word champions, the attentiveness of the listening students seemed to sharpen. Perhaps Dumbledore had noticed their sudden stillness, for he smiled as he said, The casket then, if you please, Mr. Filch. Filch, who had been lurking unnoticed in a far corner of the hall, now approached Dumbledore, while carrying a massive wooden chest encrusted with jewels. It looked ancient. A murmur of excited interest rose from the watching students. The instructions for the tasks the champions will face this year have already been examined by Mr. Crouch and Mr. Bagman, said Dumbledore. Filch placed the chest carefully on the table before him, and T. Hay have made the necessary arrangements for each challenge. There will be three tasks spaced throughout the school year. Each task will test the champions in many different ways, their magical prowess, their daring, their powers of deduction, and of course, their ability to cope with danger. Quinn shook his head sideways. To the current him, the tasks didn't seem so... dangerous. The hall was filled with absolute silence. Nobody seemed to be breathing. As you know, only three champions will compete in the tournament, Dumbledore went on calmly, one from each of the participating schools. They will be assessed on how well they perform each of the tournament tasks. The champion with the highest total after the third task will win the Triwizard Cup. The champions will be chosen by an impartial selector, the Goblet of Fire. Dumbledore took out his wand and tapped it three times on the top of the casket. The lid creaked and it slowly opened. Dumbledore reached inside it and pulled out a large, roughly hewn wooden cup. It would have been entirely unremarkable had it not been full to the brim with dancing blue-white flames. Dumbledore closed the casket and placed the goblet carefully on top of it, where it would be clearly visible to everyone in the hall. Those who wish to submit themselves as champions must write their name and school clearly in a slip of parchment and drop it into the goblet, said Dumbledore. 
all aspiring champions will have 24 hours to put their names forward. Tomorrow night, Halloween, the goblet shall select the names of the three it has judged most worthy to represent their schools. The goblet will be placed in the entrance hall tonight, where it will be freely accessible to all those who wish to compete. To ensure that no underage student yields to temptation, said Dumbledore, I will be drawing an age line around the Goblet of Fire once it has been placed in the entrance hall. Nobody under the age of 17 will be able to cross this line. Quinn barely, barely, held back a scoff and laughter at the mention of the age line. The age line hadn't prevented anything in the original book. If it was me, I would have kept the goblet hidden and ask the headmasters to choose the candidates before taking the slips from them to put the names myself, thought Quinn. Of course, that was in hindsight. Quinn wasn't sure what he would have done if he hadn't been aware of the plan brewing up in the background. Finally, I wish to impress upon whomever wants to compete that this tournament is not to be treaded lightly. Once a champion has been selected by the Goblet of Fire, they are obliged to end the tournament through to the end. The placing of your name in the goblet constitutes a binding, magical contract. You won't be able to withdraw once you have become a champion. Therefore, I implore you that you wholeheartedly prepare yourselves to the idea of competing before dropping your name into the goblet. In any case, I think it is time for bed. Good night and happy dreams. Quinn watched the wooden cup. I need to make some preparations thought Quinn. He looked at the goblet once again, with plans forming in his mind. Quinn West, MC, I am the greatest showman. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 143. Prevention. Candidates. Unknown event. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at tappan.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The same night the Goblet of Fire was revealed to the students and the Triwizard Tournament was opened. A figure walked alone in the empty corridors of Hogwarts Castle. The figure, dressed in a dark brown hooded attire, silently moved on the castle's ground floor in the dead of the night. They appeared in front of a great closed door. The figure stepped towards the door, but stopped before he could enter, and the raised hands could push the door open. The figure stepped back and took something out from their pocket. After muttering a few words, the figure watched the object intently. Satisfied with their findings, the figure pocketed the article before raising both hands. A white light membrane spread outwards, soon covering the great door. Seeing that the magical membrane remained white, the figure pushed the great door open to enter the hall. He should really start using detection wards. He is the headmaster for magic's sake, sighed the figure. He pulled up the hood. It was Quinn. Standing in the great hall, Quinn looked ahead. He walked forward. A hewn wooden goblet stood with dancing blue-white flames in it. It had been placed in the hall's center on the stool that usually bore the sorting hat. Surrounding the goblet, a thin golden line had been traced on the floor. As Quinn stood just outside the boundary, he squatted down and nodded in appreciation. Well, I have to give it to Dumbledore. This certainly will keep the students out. The age line was strong, very strong. But that wasn't exactly surprising, as the one who cast the age line was an accomplished magical user that even had the death stick as a focus. Now, let's see if what is said is true or not, smiled Quinn and took out a blank slip of paper. The paper slip levitated and flew into the area past the age line, but the moment it did, the paper burned into ashes. All right, levitating a slip into the goblet is covered, nodded Quinn. Then, he continued to test out different things, like conjuring a bird and, with a slip in its beak to drop it in goblet, throwing a crumpled ball of paper without magic, and so on. But every time, the blank slip of paper would burn in a whitish-blue flare, turning into dust. Is this Dumbledore's spell work or the goblet's innate magic, pondered Quinn, before coming to a circumstantial conclusion that as the paper burned in white-blue just like the goblet's flames, the magic must be from the goblet. I should hurry. He took out a piece of light red chalk from his pockets and started to draw along the age line, 
circling the goblet till a dull red circle enclosed the age line. He knelt down and touched the chalk line with a finger. He closed his eyes and started to channel his magic into the chalk. Suddenly, the dull red chalk started to glow up in a neon red color. Then the circle's line transformed into thrumming runic characters that sent out slight undulations of magic. And promptly, everything disappeared. Phew, this chalk sure is a powerful conduit, thought Quinn. The red chalk was one of the runic conduit materials that he had researched and developed in his free time. The chalk stick wasn't something Quinn regularly used to draw runes with, as he preferred to either etch runes into wood metal or inscribe them in parchment, cloth, or leather. Let's see whether this works, said Quinn. He took out one of his personal Royal Blue WMF ID cards. Then, he moved the card to see his signature in bronze ink. Below the signature written in bronze was Ilvermorny School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. He raised his right hand towards, and the space near his hand distorted, and at the same time, the area surrounding the goblet distorted. With every second, the distortion became stronger. Come on, this shouldn't be hard. Barty Jr. could do it. I should be able to do the same, groaned Quinn. He hadn't onsidered that Barty Jr. had had help from a master of magical arts, though. Even though he didn't know, when Quinn surpassed 80% of his total output, his eyes turned from stone gray to purple. Starting at 40% percent output, Quinn's magic had already reached a point that couldn't be seen from a miner. It was so potent that the distortion had grown to form a path between his hand and the goblet. The goblet of fire was now glowing so bright that Quinn was having trouble looking at it, and the entire hall was illuminated in a white bluish light. The flames inside the goblet turned suddenly red again. Sparks began to fly from it. The next moment, a tongue of flame shot into the air for a while before the fire subsided to their usual calm state. What changed, however, was the color. The flames remained red. It worked, finally. That was one powerful confundus, sighed Quinn, and his purple eyes turned stone gray once again. The goblet was in its active state. Right now, it would accept every single name put out into it. The goblet of fire didn't have an age limit, which meant that if someone got past the age line, they would be able to put in their names, but Quinn didn't want to mess with the age line in case Dumbledore had done something special with it. So he targeted the goblet itself by disabling all the innate security measures. Now I can enter my name, said Quinn, and flicked his signed WMF eyed card towards the goblet, fully intending to enter his name for the tournament. From the bottom of his heart, Quinn wanted his name to enter the goblet so he could become a champion. The card flew in a curved path towards the goblet, but mid-flight, the royal blue card was attacked by a red zap of lightning, shredding and incinerating it simultaneously. Oh, it worked, said Quinn, clapping his hand. Quinn West had nothing to gain by entering the Triwizard Tournament. He had the money, and even if he wanted personal fame unrelated to his family, Quinn had plenty of ways to publicize him. The red chalk line was a warding charm bound to the chalk conduit, which was designed to eliminate any mention of his name and a few other names. While Quinn ensured that he carelessly didn't leave behind his signatures and name written by his own hand, a few things outside his secure personal collection contained them. So if someone got their hands on those select few samples and used them to enter his name, he needed to make sure they wouldn't work. Quinn could enter himself in the Triwizard, but no one else was allowed. Intent is paramount, whispered Quinn. The best way to check that his defense worked was if Quinn himself entered his name with the full intention to participate in a weakened, confused goblet of fire. Putting all those conditions together resulted in the optimal situation to enter a name. My work is done here, smiled Quinn, giving the goblet of fire a glance. Red flames flashed before turning back to their normal white-bluish state. He pulled up his hood, took out recon, which he had checked before entering the Great Hall, and observed his vicinity. The map showed no one was near him, but Quinn did see the Death Eater out in the corridors outside of the professor's apartments when he said Barty Jr.'s name. Everybody is working hard, even the bad guys, chuckled Quinn before pulling on his hood and disappearing out of sight. As the next day was Saturday, most students would generally have breakfast late. 
However, many students rose much earlier than they usually did on weekends. Quinn and the gang were always comparatively early to get because of Quinn and Eddie's early morning workouts. As such, Marcus and Luna had gained a habit to get up early so they could go have breakfast early. When they went down into the Great Hall, they saw about 20 people milling around it, some of them eating toast, all examining the Goblet of Fire. It was in the same place Quinn had seen it at night, and they stood outside of the Golden Age line. Anyone put their name in yay? T? Eddie asked a third-year girl eagerly. All the Durmstrang lot, she replied, but I haven't seen anyone from Hogwarts yet. Bet some of them put it in last night after we'd all gone to bed, said Marcus. I would have if it had been me, wouldn't have wanted everyone watching. What if the goblet just gobbled you right back out again? Someone laughed behind them. Turning, all saw Fred and George Weasley, along with Harry Potter and Ron Weasley, entering the hall, looking extremely excited. Quinn watched, semi-interestingly, as Fred pulled a slip of parchment out of his pocket, bearing the words, Fred Weasley, Hogwarts. Fred Weasley walked right up to the edge of the line and stood there, rocking on his toes like a diver preparing for a 50-foot drop. Then, with the eyes of every person in the entrance hall upon him, he took a great breath and stepped over the line. For a split second, everyone thought it had worked. George, Harry, and Ron certainly thought so, for they let out a yell of triumph and leaped after Fred. But next moment, there was a loud sizzling sound, and all four were hurled out of the golden circle as though they had been thrown by an invisible shot putter. They landed painfully ten feet away on the cold stone floor, and to add insult to injury, there was a loud popping noise, and both of them sprouted identical long white beards. Quinn looked at Harry lying on the ground and thought in amusement, You don't need to try so hard, buddy. Someone already did your work for you. The great hall rang with laughter. Even Fred and George joined in once they had gotten to their feet and taken a good look at each other's beards. I did warn you, said a deep, amused voice, and everyone turned to see Professor Dumbledore coming into the Great Hall. He surveyed Fred and George, his eyes twinkling. I suggest you both go up to Madame Pomfrey. She is already tending to Miss Fawcett, of Ravenclaw, and Mr. Summers, of Hufflepuff, both of whom decided to age themselves up a little, too, though I must say, neither of their beards is anything like as fine as yours. Quinn glanced at the headmaster and thought, he appeared out of nowhere. Does he have a detection imbibed into the age line? Maybe something that would trigger with the age line. He looked at the golden line and then shrugged in indifference. As long as his or his close friend's names weren't put in, he couldn't care less. The four set off for the hospital wing, accompanied by Lee, who was howling with laughter. The decorations in the great hall had changed this morning. As it was Halloween, a cloud of live bats fluttered around the enchanted ceiling while hundreds of carved pumpkins leered from every corner. Quinn, of course, for the occasion, had put on his point hat with a few Halloween-themed lapel pins just like he did every year. Luna had copied him and worn her hat a few self-made Halloween accessories. Marcus celebrated by eating pumpkin pie for breakfast and Eddie enjoyed the occasion by scaring some first and second years with home-brewed horror stories. There's a rumor going around that Warrington got up early and put his name in, said Marcus. That big bloke from Slytherin who looks like a sloth. Eddie, who had played Quidditch with the Ravenclaw team and heard about Warrington, looked away from the little ones and shook his head in disgust. We can't have him as a champion. And all the Hufflepuffs are talking about Diggory, continued Eddie mockingly. But I wouldn't have thought he'd have wanted to risk his good looks. Oh, he will enter his name. There is no doubt about that, he told me himself, and I think he already did it, said Quinn informing. People suddenly cheered in the great hall. They all swiveled around in their seats and saw Angelina Johnson coming into the hall, grinning in an embarrassed sort of way. She walked over to Goblet and entered her name. Hmm. She turned 17 last week, didn't she? thought Quinn, a finger on his temple as he pulled out information from his mindscape. The students' feff, Rom Bobetons came through the front doors from the entrance hall, among them the Vila, Fleur de la Cour. Those gathered around the Goblet of Fire stood back to let them pass, watching eagerly. 
Madame Maxime entered the hall behind her students and organized them into a line. One by one, the Bobatan students stepped across the age line and dropped their slips of parchment into the blue-white flames. As each name entered the fire, it turned briefly red and emitted sparks. What do you reckon will happen to the ones who aren't chosen? Marcus muttered to Quinn as the Fleur dropped her parchment into the goblet of fire. Reckon they'll go back to school or hang around to watch the tournament? They will stay and study with sixth and seventh year students, answered Quinn. Can't have them wasting time here and not have them study. When all the Beaubaton students had submitted their names, Madame Maxime led them back out of the hall and out onto the grounds again. Quinn closed his eyes for a second and thought as the Beaubaton students exited. That completes the entry of all four champions. The preparations are clear. The stage is set. Time to open the game. I finally have some free time, Mr. West, said McGonagall, turning to Quinn, who was sitting in front of her inside her office. We have something to talk about, and you have a lot to answer about. Answers to all of your questions, Professor, replied Quinn with a smile. Let's talk about what you did in the Great Hall yesterday, started McGonagall. I'm sure that wasn't included in your duties. Indeed it wasn't, ma'am, said Quinn as he continued to smile. But if Bobans and Durmstrang can show off their magic, Hogwarts should be able to get a chance to represent itself. And you took that responsibility on yourself. That I did. Four mascots, four founders, four houses all coming together to create one school, binding everyone under one banner. With the time I was given, I came up with a performance that represented Hogwarts as a whole. I think it was nice, don't you? Spoke Quinn, confident and pleased with his work. You could have talked with us before you put on that. We were trying to be welcoming, but then you spurred on something much larger than what Beau Batons and Durmstrang had prepared, sighed McGonagall. Olymp Maxime and Igor Karkaroff weren't happy with the sudden situation. You have to understand that the Triwizard Tournament has been set up to improve international relations. Hmm. I can see that happening, nodded Quinn, understanding her point. But those two don't matter. What matters are the students. If we have a positive outlook towards each other, then two people won't matter in the long run. Durmstrang and Slytherin bonded together because of their similar ideology, and Ravenclaw students were able to interact with Bo's Baton students with my performance as the topic. It was the fact that our students didn't know about my performance that they felt a true surprise and were able to relate with the foreign students. He shrugged and summarized his actions in simple words. All I did was provide an icebreaker of sorts, one simple step to set off a domino of positivity. McGonagall seemed to be at a loss for words. She could see sense in Quinn's words. The students were the future, and if they were happy and positively reacting to each other, then the older generation indeed didn't matter in the long run. But I see what you're worried about, Professor, said Quinn, gaining her attention. Professors can have a big impact on the students. Hmm, I guess we can do something to improve their impression of us. McGonagall felt relieved about Quinn's willingness to work with her, but then she saw a wide smile bloom on Quinn's face which plunged her heart into sudden caution and suspicion. Mr. West, I will be honest with you, I don't like that smile of yours. Quinn laughed happily at her reaction. No need to worry about it, Professor. Actually, you will be the happy saint about the reason behind my smile. He took out a folded sheet of paper from his clothes. After unfolding it and eliminating creases with magic, he slid the paper across the tables towards McGonagall. He sat back as the premier Quidditch nut picked the sheet and started to read it. As McGonagall read it, her eyes widened in surprise. Mr. Mr. West, this. Are you sure? Are you sure we can do this? Please tell me you have given it thought. It won't be easy. Not in our school. McGonagall was surprised, hopeful, and suspicious because of doubt about Quinn's plans. It didn't look like it would succeed, but if it did, then it would be huge. I have thought it through, Professor. I can make it happen, smirked Quinn. All I require is complete control over the operation, the power and authority to do it my own way, and don't have to answer to anyone. I will approach them on my own with no supervision. That, McGonagall hesitated for a good while before nodding. 
If you can get results, then I will grant you the permission. But if it fails, then... It won't fail, Professor, smiled Quinnan, and a deal was set. He was going to put up a show. With this, step one is complete, thought Quinn, grinning inside. Quinn West, MC, planning and plotting. Minerva McGonagall, deputy headmistress. If this succeeds, this. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 144, Four Champions, Venturing into the Darkness. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at dapreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The Halloween feast seemed to take much longer than usual. Perhaps because it was their second feast in two days, people didn't seem to fancy the extravagantly prepared food as much as they would typically have. Like everyone else in the hall, judging by the constantly craning necks, the impatient expressions on every face, the fidgeting, and then standing up to see whether Dumbledore had finished eating yet, Quinn too wanted the plates to clear, and to hear who had been selected as champions. His reason wasn't the same as others. Quinn 99% knew who would get chosen. He simply wanted to enjoy the commotion that would follow. At long last, the golden plates returned to their original spotless state. There was a sharp upswing in the level of noise within the hall, which died away almost instantly as Dumbledore got to his feet. On either side of him, Professor Karkaroff and Madame Maxime looked as tense and expectant as anyone. Ludo Bagman was beaming and winking at various students. Mr. Crouch, however, seemed entirely uninterested, almost bored. Well, the goblet is almost ready to make its decision, said Dumbledore. I estimate that it requires one more minute. Now, when the champions' names are called, I would ask them to please come up to the top of the hall, walk along with the staff table, and go through into the next chamber, he indicated the door behind the staff table, where they will be receiving their first instructions. He took out his wand and gave a great sweeping wave with it. At once, all the candles, except those inside the carved pumpkins, were extinguished, plunging them into a state of semi-darkness. Show off, muttered Quinn, but with a smile on his face as he enjoyed the dramatics. The goblet of fire now shone more brightly than anything in the whole hall, the sparkling bright bluey whiteness of the flames almost painful on the eyes. Everyone watched, waiting. A few people kept checking their watches. Any second, Eddie whispered, a seat away from Quinn. The flames inside the goblet turned suddenly red again, turning to its activation state. Sparks began to fly from it. The next moment, a tongue of flame shot into the air. A charred piece of parchment fluttered out of it. The whole room gasped. Dumbledore caught the piece of parchment and held it at arm's length so that he could read it by the light of the flames, which had turned back to blue-white. The champion for Durmstrang, he read in a strong, clear voice, will be Victor Crumb. As a storm of applause and cheering swept the hall, Quinn saw Victor Crumb rise from the Slytherin table and slouch up toward Dumbledore. He turned right, walked along with the staff table, and disappeared through the door into the next chamber. Bravo, Victor, boomed Karkaroff, so loudly that everyone could hear him, even over all the applause. Knew you had it in you. The clapping and chatting died down. Now everyone's attention was focused again on the goblet, which, seconds later, turned red once more. A second piece of parchment shot out of it, propelled by the flames. The champion for Beaubaton, said Dumbledore, is Fleur Delacour. Quinn leaned back to see the Vila get up gracefully to her feet, shook back her sheet of silvery blonde hair, and swept up between the Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff tables. She passed by him confidently towards Dumbledore. Oh look, they're all disappointed, Luna said over the noise, nodding toward the remainder of the Bowbottom's party. Disappointed was a bit of an understatement, Quinn thought. Two of the girls who had not been selected had dissolved into tears and were sobbing with their heads in their arms. When Fleur Delacour too had vanished into the side chamber, silence fell again, but this time, it was a silence so stiff with excitement, you could almost taste eye. The Hogwarts champion next, and the goblet of fire turned red once more. Sparks showered out of it, the tongue of flame shot high into the air, and from its tip, 
Dumbledore pulled the third piece of parchment. The Hogwarts champion, he called, is Cedric Diggory. Every single Hufflepuff had jumped to their feet, screaming and stamping as Cedric made his way past them, grinning broadly and headed off toward the chamber behind the teacher's table. Indeed, the applause for Cedric went on so long that it was some time before Dumbledore could make himself heard again. Excellent, Dumbledore called happily, as at last the tumult died down. Well, we now have our three champions. I am sure I can count upon all of you, including the remaining students from Bobaton Durmstrang, to give your champions every ounce of support you can muster. By cheering your champion on, you will contribute in a very real. But Dumbledore suddenly stopped speaking, and it was apparent to everybody what had distracted him. The fire in the goblet had just turned red again. Sparks were flying out of it. A long flame shot suddenly into the air, and borne upon it was another piece of parchment. Quinn's heartbeat quickened as automatically, it seemed, Dumbledore reached out with an extended hand and seized the parchment. He held it out and stared at the name written upon it. Come on, old man. Spit it out, thought Quinn, staring intently at Dumbledore. There was a long pause, during which Dumbledore stared at the slip in his hands. Everyone in the room stared at Dumbledore, and then Dumbledore cleared his throat and read out Harry Potter. Quinn clenched his fist, and inside his head, he did an imaginary fist pump of celebration. Hell yeah! Not me sucker! The paranoia of Quinn West finally calmed down. After Quinn's short celebration, he turned his attention back to his surroundings. There was no applause. As though of angry bees, a buzzing was starting to fill the hall. Some students were standing up to get a better look at Harry Potter as he sat, frozen, in his seat. While Harry had tried to put his name into the goblet with the Weasley twins and Ron, he had failed. Even if he had succeeded in getting his name, Harry had never thought he would get selected. But now, Dumbledore was calling out his name. To see this took him by shock was an understatement. Quinn removed his fourth champion and turned his sight to more interesting people in the hall. Up at the head table, Professor McGonagall had got to her feet and swept past Ludo Bagman and Professor Karkaroff to whisper urgently to Professor Dumbledore, who bent his ear toward her, frowning slightly. Still watching from his table, Quinn raised an eyebrow as he observed them before another professor caught his eye. Lily Potter sat on her chair, but the mother of two looked shell-shocked, her face portraying her current emotions clear and transparently. Now I feel bad for her, thought Quinn, and seeing that his eyes were on a Potter, he decided to shift his sight to the third Potter and watch the girl twin with her hand on her twin's shoulder. Ivy Potter looked as if she was rapidly asking questions to Harry. Her twin, though, sat still on his seat, not answering her question. Finally, Quinn looked at the initiator of this situation and watched the figure of Barty Crouch Jr. in the form of Alastor Moody with a hidden gaze. For once, Moody's eyes were still, and if one could ignore the strap holding the magical artificial eye, Moody's eye pair looked like they were normal. At the top table, Dumbledore had straightened up, nodding to Professor McGonagall. Harry Potter, he called again. Harry, up here if you please. Harry got to his feet, trod on the hem of his robes, and stumbled slightly. He set off up the gap between the Gryffindor and Hufflepuff tables. The boy who lived, with hundreds of eyes on him, took a long walk towards the head table. The buzzing grew louder and louder as he reached the head table, before following Dumbledore's instruction to exit the Great Hall to the antechamber. Now that's an eventful Halloween, nodded Quinn, but his voice drowned way in the voice of the entire Great Hall's chatter and talk. Quinn took out a chocolate cube from his pocket. The dice-sized cube cooled down with a faint gush of ice magic, and as he popped the cold chocolate into his mouth, Quinn only had one thought. Halloween sure isn't good for potters. The next day... While the castle was still fresh with the last day's events, Quinn could be found near the Forbidden Forest dressed in noir transformative gear. He wasn't interested in listening to everyone talk about the fourth champion and wanted to get some work done. Forenza had guided him on his first visit, but now Quinn had navigated his own way to the darkness within the Forbidden Forest. Standing at the edge of darkness, Quinn looked into the darkness with his hood still up. This is going to be tough, 
his voice distorted. There are too many of them inside. The last time Quinn had gone in, he was attacked by a clutter of acromantula. They had tried to tear him apart and feast on him with ferocious intensity as Quinn had to fend off Archimantulas trying to get to him, even if it meant they would get burned. A few minutes, and I nearly burned through 50% of my capacity, spat Quinn. The shield spell, which burned when touch. The spikes from Quinn's patent ice magic, and the orange spell which had cleared a path in front of him. The three spells had burned through a lot of magic. Well, most of it was used by the shield, said Quinn, clicking his tongue. I can't blow the place up. If he did that, the residents, living inside the darkness or not, wouldn't appreciate their home being torn apart by explosions. I can't be on defense. Putting up the shield isn't doing me any favors. If he wanted to get past the acromantulas, Quinn needed to preserve the magic and not spend his entire capacity on them, leaving him vulnerable to other danger. For that, I need my sight back. Unlike inside water, Quinn didn't know how to use a magical ripple sonar radar to navigate without sight, so Quinn needed to find another way to see, and in the time between this visit and the first, Quinn had found a way to get his sight back inside the darkness. He placed his palms over his hands, and magic entered his eyes through his palms. The human eye lets light in through a hole called the pupil. A lens inside the eye focused on the image, and the retina detected that image. The retina contained two structures called rods and cones that detected light and sent the image to the brain. Rods were great at capturing very dim light and movement. However, they do not detect colors. Humans could see colors so vividly because of cones, which can only function with plenty of light. They had four times the number of rods than we have cones. This ratio meant that humans could see pretty well during the day, and though they have more rods than cones overall, humans had more cones than many animals. They could see many kinds of colors during the day, and we still see reasonably well in the dark. However, other animals with more rods and fewer cones than humans could see even better in the dark, even if their color vision wasn't as good during the day. Right now, Quinn's magic was altering the structure of his eyes. Inside his eyes, rods increased in quantity while cones sinking in numbers. Cats, owls, raccoons, red foxes, bullfrogs. Quinn had ordered eyes of various nocturnal animals with a ratio of rods and cones, which allowed night vision. Going through them, he created an eye structure that would let him see in the dark. Ugh, I don't like doing this one, said Quinn, and when he removed his hands, Quinn's iris had widened, and inside, the pupils were so large that the stone gray was nothing but a thin ring on the outside. As he looked around, Quinn found that the dim forest was brighter, as if he was standing under clear sunlight. He looked ahead, and the darkness had turned into a late evening light. Yeah, I can work with that, he smiled, but it wasn't at his success. The smile was at the shining dots he could see inside. Numerous eight-eyed sets stared at him from just within the darkness, watching, observing if Quinn would enter their territory. Let's get started. With the hood on, he stepped inside the darkness, and pandemonium ensued. The second the black-clad Quinn entered the darkness, two comparatively small acromantula dove down from the tree canopy and jumped on Quinn, their pincers clacking in excitement. Quinn's transfigured eyes briefly glanced up and grinned. I can see you. The two spiders that had jumped on their target felt a force against their bodies. Like taking a giant sledgehammer straight to the body, they were blown away before the two could touch the ground. With a serviceable sight providing him with visuals, Quinn could finally focus on individual targets, something he couldn't previously as his vision was short and limited. Plus, Acromantula held venom in their pincers, a single cut, and Quinn would be in deep trouble. Not even a second had passed since Quinn had launched two banishing charms. He twitched when he felt something at his back. A transparent shield formed behind his back just before an Acromantula slammed against it, sending silvery waves along with the shield. With a turn on his neck, Quinn gave a brief glance for the offending Acromantula to feel a heavy force from above and found himself being slammed into the dirt. You need to do better if you want to eat me said Quinn as his eyes moved left to the right, looking at the acromantulas creeping towards him on their clacking pincers. 
The provocation seemed to work as one of the biggest, baddest acromantula jumped Quinn with a loud shriek. Quinn raised his arm for a shield to appear, and the acromantula slammed against the shield. He used the shield to push the massive, hairy spider down, thrusting the spider into the ground before casting a point-blank explosion charm to rip three out of eight legs apart. A painful screech filled the darkness, and for a split second, the spiders backed away, but the agony from their kind made their blood boil and simultaneously jumped out on Quinn. From above, one could see a black figure standing in the center with gigantic spiders throwing themselves at him. Shields would appear to stop the spiders who go too close while Quinn rammed their siblings away with magic. With every second, the scene started to get violent. What had begun as harmless, yet a little tough spell push from Banishing Spell was now a bloody scene as Quinn was breaking their pincers to make sure they won't return any anytime soon. Not so proactive after losing three legs, aren't you, thought Quinn. He could see that the clutter was lightening up, bringing a smile to his face. But then there was sudden reversal as Quinn saw something white from the corner of his eyes. He had no time to react as something thick and gooey attached itself on Quinn's elbow. His eyes widened when he saw what it was. Spiderweb. The exclamation was met with a pull as Quinn's body was pulled to the right towards an acromantula, shrieking in glee. But before Quinn's feet could leave the ground, another spiderweb stuck to his body and pulled him to the left. The acromantulas weren't coordinating and mainly moving on their own, which helped Quinn as he felt the two opposite forces pull him in opposite directions. The force lifted him up from the ground, but he stayed in a single spot, giving Quinn enough time to release a sharp cold wave into the thick, sticky, yet steel-like webs and froze them till they were rigid. He cast blasting curses on the frozen bindings for them to shatter into ice shards. Yes, he celebrated, but then his pupils shrunk as he felt a stinky smell waft across his nose. He moved his eyes up to see an open mouth with fangs inside about to bite his head off. A shiver went through his body as he found himself in a life-death moment. Time seemed to slow down as Quinn Khan tinyed to stare at the acromantula's hairy feature, and strangely, he could see joy inside the leader. His magic moved on instinct, and a deep, murky, dark maroon orb formed in front of Quim before it stretched out and zapped straight into the mouth. The magic entered the body through the body, and the acromantula started to feel quizzy as its body heat raised. It went from comfortable warmth to burning heat in a matter of spans seconds. It began to shriek and dropped right in front of Quinn, writhing in pain. Quinn shot two spells, each on the two different sides towards his almost captures. There were blasts, and shrieks were intense and short build as a second spell hit them. He hadn't removed his eyes from the acromantual who was writhing on the floor. The spell was a dark curse, one that would corrode the target user. Right now, the spider was feeling everything burn as the curse worked its charm. Seeing the acromantula so close, Quinn raised his hand, and a murky yellow spell light appeared over his hand. He was about to take out all of the acromantula's legs in one clean sweep, essentially destroying the spider's life. A yell filled the surroundings. Halt! Hello, peeps. Fiction-only reader this side. This author's note is to inform you that till the end of this month, which means four days, the release update schedule is going to be pretty janky erratic. My midterms are upon me, and I haven't studied Jack. I need to pull all nights, hate him, to make sure I don't fail. As such, I might not be able to post regularly, but from 1st of September, I'll be back as my midterms will be over. This ends the PSA. You can proceed to the short post-chapter credit section. Quinn West, MC, Spiders vs. Me, Let's Dance. Fiction-only reader, author who makes lots of grammar mistakes, Alan L. Mighty Editor isn't feeling well, please send best wishes. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 145, Argog and the Other Tournament. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at chestflesh woncom fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by editor Alan. Wait, stop.
A clutter of acromantulas surrounding Quinn were attacking him with the sole desire to feast on his flesh. They were trying hard to get a taste of human flesh and blood, but stopped when they heard a word from a voice. With piercing cackles and shrieks, they protested against getting held back, but a louder, more piercing, mighty shrill screech made them cower and bend their eight legs in submission. The human, on the other hand, exhaled a deep breath, releasing a small puff of icy mist into the air, and with it, dozens of ice spears manifested into the dark surrounding, gleaming in the spider's eight-set eyes. That was, ah, uh, thought Quinn, refraining his hands to go to his ears, so damn harsh. He moved towards the source of the shri, a bigger, meaner, bulkier acromantula slowly creeping towards him, as the crowd of regular acromantula parted way for the eight-legged elephant-sized monstrosity. Wait, 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 thought Quinn with a mental chuckle of disbelief. Isn't this one too big? The ice spikes around him rotated to face the new arrival, but in the face of the arachnid, they were akin to thin ice picks, human. There was gray in the black of his body and legs, and each of the eyes on his ugly, pincered head were milky white. It was blind. You must be the one who is called Aragog, said Quinn, raising his chin to peer at the leader of the Acromantula colony composed of all of his sons and daughters. That I am, he said, clicking his pincers rapidly. Why have you entered my home, human? He looked around, and with his eight white eyes, he made a sidelong glance around his children. Not only that, but you dare to harm my children. Give me a reason why I shouldn't kill you on the spot. Aragog could sense that some of his children were gravely injured, a few of those not in any condition to live much longer, but he showed no grief for them. This was the forbidden forest. The strong lived, and the weak perished. I want to venture inside to get to the cursed vault said Quinn, his voice amplified and distorted, ringing inside a silent forest. So, why should I care about it? Do I look like I care about what you think? I don't give a shit about what you and your children think or want. The entire cluster of spiders stepped closer to Quinn, their pincers clicking rapidly and continuously, filling the forest with a sickening noise capable of bringing shivers down the spine of most people. Don't test your luck, human. I can make your death. Not so swift, spoke Aragog, the fangs inside his mouth gleaming as he calmly snarled. Oh yeah? scoffed Quinn, taking the provocation as a chance to pump magic into his spikes, enlarging them as ice creaked and cracked while manifesting. Bring it on, let's see who comes out alive. I like that hide of yours. Maybe I will strip it off your carcass. The colossal arachnid didn't make any moves or spoke anything in reply. The eight blind eyes focused on the vague figure of Quinn. His pincers were slowly opening and closing. Before long, Aragog clicked his pincers once for a fast and crisp noise to shatter the pregnant silence. Hmph, cursed vault, you say. Aragog scoffed with derision. Humans have always been dull-brained. Go, I am looking forward to the day you die and rot inside. Aragog screeched and clicked his pincers, and it seemed to be an order to his children, because the acromantula retreated away from Quinn, shooting webs above to the trees, climbing up to disappear in the dark forage of forest. Leaving Aragog and Quinn on the ground, as they kept watch upon the two. Beware, human, if you come out injured, neither me nor my children like you. Should we get a scent of your blood wafting around, we will drag you to our nest. There was a gleeful tenor in his voice as he too made webs up to climb up the forage. I look forward to the day when I get to taste your flesh and blood. I hope the day comes soon. Aragog, the Acromantula, disappeared and left before Quinn could say anything. Yeah, run. You better run, big freak, grumbled Quinn. He waved his hand and the ice spikes puffed in a cold mist. He moved his gaze towards the fallen Acromantulas, which had gotten too injured in the fight for them to move. They were heavily wounded, and as such, were now thrown out of the colony. The law of the jungle, huh? muttered Quinn, moving towards the fallen. Noticing Quinn approaching, the acromantula's eight eyes shifted towards him. Human, said the spider with four twisted legs. Quinn stared down at the spider, which he had ended up injuring. He matched eyes with the arachnid and nodded. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Quinn extended his hand towards the spider, as he looked up above at the leaves, ignoring the acromantula eyes peering down at him. He looked past them and breathed out. Crack! 
Closing his eyes, Quinn heard the silence of the forest before looking down. Laid near his feet was the lifeless body of the spider. The eight set of dull, wholly black eyes with no whites were looking as if staring at him. He turned his head to the left to see the inner depth of the place he had come to call the underworld. He realized there were more and more blackened trees, grayish ground, and dull grass. And perhaps it was because of his transfigured eyes, but Quinn felt that the underworld was more lifeless than the last time. To his right was the path that led him to the outside. He could see the brightness inviting him to move towards it in the distance. The trail led back to the brighter portion of the Forbidden Four, with plenty of lights to light up the surroundings. He sighed. The mood to go left deeper into the underworld had disappeared. Right now he wanted to go back to the castle and relax. But before that, he had work to do. He turned away from the spider body and walked a few steps before. Inside a classroom in the transfiguration wing of the castle stood four people, looking at each other apprehensively. From the looks of it, they weren't happy to be in the same room. The four were dressed in similar black robes and gray uniforms beneath. The only difference was the color of the trims present on the robes and the personalization in the uniform. Red and gold, blue and bronze, yellow and black, green and silver. Why in the world are we called here? Asked the person dressed in green and silver. He was known to the students for his ever-present mocking smirk, but currently his face was locked in an uncomfortable expression as he stared at the other three. I have no idea, said the girl dressed in red and gold, shaking her head. She had been nervous coming here, but when the girl saw her company, she calmed down. I have no idea, but we can pretty much assume what this is about, shrugged the boy in blue and bronze. Slight intelligence flashed in his eyes as he observed the pattern he saw in the people with him. Well, he is the one who called us. I'm sure he has something important to say, spoke the boy, dressed in yellow and black. If he had been in another group, his lovely smile would have charmed others, but the other three just wanted to bash his face in, just so that they wouldn't need to see it. Before it opened, there was a knock on the door for another person dressed in blue and bronze to enter the room. He gazed at them, and a smile bloomed on his face as if joyous to see them all. Pusey, Johnson, Davies, and Diggory, said the black-haired boy in a pleased tone, I'm glad you've accepted my invitation. I was worried that you might be busy. The four watched as their inviter, Quinn West, fifth-year Ravenclaw, stood by the door, looking at them. He turned his head outside the room and said, Everyone is here, you can enter. The four watched with confusion and curio, city, wondering who Quinn was talking to. Two people enter the room, one blonde, posh-looking boy and a flamboyant brunette girl. Quinn took out his fake wand and waved it once for seven chairs to be pulled out from the room's corner. The seven chairs circularly arranged themselves in the center of the room. He nonchalantly pulled a chair and sat down, making himself comfortable. Sit down. We have a lot to discuss, he said, causing others to look at him as he acted like this classroom was his home. West, why did you call me here? I'm busy, grumbled Adrian Pusey, sixth-year Slytherin. He looked at the other Hogwarts student and sneered, and you invited these plebs to come here. Who do you think you're calling a pleb snake, sneered Roger Davies, sixth-year Ravenclaw, looking defiantly at Pusey as if ready to fight. You both should calm down, sighed Quinn, pointing to the two who came with him. We have guests. Angelina Johnson looked at the two unfamiliar people and asked, You are from Bogues and Durmstrang, right? Yes said the flamboyant girl in heavily accented English, dressed casually with her legs crossed as she leaned into the back of her chair. Kari Haugen, from Durmstrang. I'm 17 years old. The posh-looking blonde boy seeing Kari introducing herself also decided to introduce himself. Good evening. My name is Albert Acey, seventh year, Bo Battens, at your service. I'm guessing that all of you are interested in the reason why you were called here said Quinn, addressing their primary source of curiosity about this gathering. Given that all of us here are the captains for the House Quidditch teams, I can safely assume that it's about Quidditch, offered Cedric as he looked at the people present in the room. Nothing less expected from the champion, said Quinn, lightly clapping. Yes, you're correct, 
It's related to Quidditch. He pointed at the two foreign students and continued, These two are also Quidditch players from their respective schools. They are both captains. They will be my contact with their schools. Not Crum? asked Roger Davies as he glanced at Kari. Kari narrowed her eyes in response. Yes, me and not Crum. Crum went pro. He has nothing to do with Durmstrang Quidditch anymore. Neither the school nor his pro club team wants him to play at Dummerstrang. Davies had the decency to look embarrassed after being indirectly berated. You've heard her, said Quinn. The reason I have called you here is that I've been handed to manage the Quidditch season at Hogwarts this year. West, you do know that Quidditch was cancelled this year for the tournament, right? said Angelina. She glanced towards Cedric at the mention of the tournament. Why are you all looking at me? It's not my fault, protested Cedric when everyone, not just Angelina, gave him the same look. Quinn chuckled at the scene before answering. Miss Johnson, the Quidditch house tournament might have been cancelled, but that doesn't mean that we can't enjoy Quidditch this year. I've decided to continue with the theme of improving international relations and start a Quidditch tournament involving students from all three schools. What do you mean? asked Adrian, confused. It will be a Quidditch tournament with the same rules, no difference there. Unlike our house tournaments that have only four teams, I have decided that there will be ten teams competing for the top spot. Sounds good? explained Quinn while observing how the others were taking it. After everyone nodded, Quinn continued, While this tournament is open to everyone, the teams will be decided by the ten team captains. They will be in charge of who they want to take in their teams. As there are ten teams, that means that seventy students will be participating in the Quidditch tournament. The four Hogwarts captains, along with Kari and Albert, looked interested and excited about the idea. They had thought that they would be missing Quidditch this year, but from what Quinn was saying, it was looking like they would not only be playing Quidditch, but it would be a unique experience from their usual annual tournaments. Out of the ten team captains, six of them will be from Hogwarts, two of them will be from Bow Battens, and the last two will be from Durmstrang, said Quinn and cut off Albert before he could speak. Given the number of students at Hogwarts, this is fair. Also, I'm not finished. There are some conditions to build a team. What conditions? First, let's talk about the Hogwarts teams. Let's say the captain is from Ravenclaw. Excluding them, there will be six more members. Out of those six members, only two members can be from Ravenclaw. As such, only three students can be from the same house as the captain. What? exclaimed Adrian. You can't do that. Even the other Hogwarts house team captains looked uncomfortable with Quinn's conditions. I can do that, and all other kinds of things. I have complete control over this tournament. To be blunt, I don't answer to any of the faculty members. If I wanted the snitch to be 10 points instead of 150, then that would be the official rules, said Quinn, leaving the others stunned. Let's continue, he said. Out of the remaining four members, one each needs to be from Bobatons and Durmstrang. That means two of the members from every team won't be from Hogwarts, allowing Bow Bottons and Durmstrang to have plenty of representation. Finally, the last two members can be chosen from other Hogwarts houses or from Bow Batons and Durmstrang. It's up to the team who they want. Quinn turned to Kari and Albert and gave them their team-building conditions. Let's say if the captain is Kari, then other than her, she can only recruit one other Durmstrang member in her team. One of the team members must be from Bow Bottons, while the remaining four will be from Hogwarts. The condition on Hogwarts members is that out of those four members, only two can be from the same house. His eyes glanced at every member of the team. He enjoyed their stunned expression. I know the first thing that popped in all your minds when I spoke about teams. All of you thought about entering your usual squads, said Quinn. Four out of ten teams would have ended up being our house teams, while at least two more would have been solely from Bose Batons and Durmstrang. I'm willing to bet a lot of money that the rest of the four would have gone the same way. But where's the fun in that? Let's try out something different while we have the chance. I have a few questions, spoke Cedric, a slight crease between his brows. Of course. 
I am assuming that we all are going to be captains, asked Cedric, pointing to the six Quidditch captains. Yes, all of you will get a team, answered Quinn, and seeing that it was Cedric who asked the question, Quinn notified him, If you don't wish to participate, given that you're a champion, you can hand over your spot to another Hufflepuff. Cedric nodded. The tasks hadn't been revealed. As such, Cedric didn't know if he would need to back out of the Quidditch tournament. My question is about the other two Hogwarts teams. With us four, said Cedric, point at the house team captains, every house gets one team each, but what about the other two? Which two houses get two teams? The house loyalty was strong in Hogwarts, so Quinn had expected the question, it will be a lucky draw, I will have someone neutral pull the houses out. What about us? asked Albert. Who gets the second team from our schools? Durmstrang's second team will go to Crum. Of course he can opt out. He then turned to Albert and asked, Does Miss Delacour play Quidditch? Albert shook his head in reply. I see. Please give me a recommendation, asked Quinn. He then looked at the captains and smiled. Start recruiting people, captains. This is going to be different from your usual seasons. There's no continuity. You will be building everything from scratch. Quinn West, MC, Challenger, Organizer. Aragog, Acromantula, Power is the Law, Exception Equal Hagrid, Fiction Only Reader. I'm back. Writing is fun. So much fun. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 146, Body Magic, Lapel Badges, a Somal. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my .com slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan. Quinn stood inside the room of requirements dressed in shorts and a t-shirt. The room had transformed according to his wishes and was now a simple spacious room with no furniture. The only thing that was present was a heavy bag that hung from a stand. He looked down on the floor. He lightly skipped on his feet. The floor had a little spring. He had given it a rubber surface. Softening charm. Check, said Quinn, continuing to jump on his feet. The trifecta, said Quinn to himself. The mind, the physical entity that deals with thinking, reasoning, our ability to make choices, and partially deals with emotions, beliefs, and attitude. While continuing to jump, he closed his eyes and dove into his mindscape. He then saw Hogwarts on one side and the West Manor on the other side. He looked up in his mental image at the simulated blue sky and looked beyond to see a faint hexagonal layer barely visible. Quinn raised his hand and waved it in front of him to feel the invisible radioactive matter omnipresent inside his mindscape. Soul, the immaterial part of a being, the part considered to be its essence, deeply connected to the magical core, along with emotions, self, consciousness, and connectedness. Quinn placed his hand on his chest. He couldn't feel his soul. It was out of his reach, with no way to gain access to it. His brow twitched when his memories sent him back to his third year, the year in which he had been under the influence of the sin curse. The curse had affected his soul, and then it had gained control over his emotions, affecting his personality and attitude. To this day, Quinn hadn't touched anything related to the soul. Body, the physical entity which houses both the mind and the soul, it comprises eleven systems that come together to form one complete system. A complex machine that is designed to support life by aligning the mind and soul to create a balance. It's the most fragile one of the three. One snap and the body can become useless and lead to its death. He stopped jumping and took a standard Muay Thai fighting stance, exhaling a heavy breath and started shadow boxing. Punches, kicks, elbow strikes, knee blows. He went through a continuous series that felt comfortable to him. A minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, and then some more time passed. The continuous movements had Quinn sweating all over. His breathing was labored, but Quinn didn't stop. He kept going. When he felt that he couldn't keep up, he would switch to an easier series, but he didn't stop. An average person can only access 40 to 50 percent of their muscular mass when performing any physical task or exertion, he said. He chuckled. What terrible efficiency, it makes one wonder about the limitations. But when doing continuous exercise with an increasing load, the body starts to warm up, muscles begin to open up, 
and a normal person can climb up to access 60% of their physical capabilities. Quinn took in a deep breath and suddenly stepped forward to get in reach of the brown, heavy bag. He upped his speed and power and started to attack the bag with rigor combined with practiced skill. Top P professional athletes with merciless, relentless, and continuous training can gain access to 80% of their muscular mass. Combining that 80% with the fact that their bodies have transcended the average by several degrees, they reach a level of not being superhuman, but they can definitely be called superhumans. But not all professional athletes can reach that level. Genetics with excellent physical properties is what allows the select few to reach that level. Quinn's body began shaking as the continuous exertion was affecting his body, but he continued to push himself despite that. The body doesn't allow us to go beyond the limit in the fear that the person would not hurt himself, but some conditions allow us to break those limits. Extreme emotions can cause a person to access the ending 20% by pumping excessively, potentially dangerous amounts of adrenaline into their bodies. He smiled as his elbow smashed into the leather of the bag. But that is for normal people, people without access to the supernatural force that reside in rare individuals. Quinn pulled his fist back and regained the standard stance. With a swift movement, Quinn twisted his body to generate force that would travel from his legs and would be exerted through his fist via punch into the heavy bed. Once again, Quinn regained a standard stance, but now he had a grin on his face. His body moved as if to punch just like the last time, but this time, Quinn used his feet to generate force, which added more physical power to his punch. Quinn's grin widened when he felt force travel up his body. He snapped his arm forward to punch the heavy bag. Whip! With the speed of a whip, Quinn's arm punched forward. Quinn watched as his fist got buried into the leather with a force that even surprised him as the stand holding the bag got knocked over. With heavy, labored breathing, a rising and lowering chest, Quinn stared at the fallen bag. Slowly, a smile replaced his surprised face. Quinn raised his hand to look at his fists. Magic, physical, body magic, he mutters. Quinn flexed his hands and observed his first use of the new body magic. I was able to get up to 70% of my best while being dead tired. I guess that is to be expected. Quinn had always been active since his preteen days, but after his third year, Quinn had been working out twice a day an outdoor workout in the morning, and an entire Muay Thai session inside the room of requirements in the evening. That had not only made him fit but also had built up some skill when he boxed. Reaching 70% at an activity that he was familiar with was a satisfactory result. Next is 80%, the regular limit of the human limit, smiled Quinn, aiming to accomplish something that would take years of constant training within a short time. After that, I will go beyond. The magic of the body was just getting started. Tick, tick. The wall clock in the AID office ticked away as Quinn sat at his desk, writing away on a sheet of paper. From the year Quinn had gotten his first set of magic-related books from Leah, he had compiled his own collection of records on every branch and topic of magic he ever learned. Throughout the years, his ever-growing library continued to get more books. In fact, he mainly joined Hogwarts to gain access to the school library along with the collections of books inside Room of Requirements. With those resources at his fingertips, Quinn's magic records grew both in quantity and quality. Compiling improved potion recipes, examining myriads of materials for transfiguration, researching thousands of herbs for their magical properties, extensively studying the essence and theory behind every spell or charm, observing planets and luminaries' movements over the years, and so on. Quinn had tried to study everything in detail and genuinely understand why magic performed as it did. There was a section filled with Quinn's research material in his personal library, a treasure trove that even the most learned magicals would salivate at because of its cross-cultured nature. No one except Quinn knew the extent of the knowledge he had amassed, though not all of it was unknown to the outside world. Over the years, some of it had been released to the outside world. The AID notes which optimized the Hogwarts material to the limit were available to every student of the magical school. His AID personal collection, which stood a level above the notes, 
was primarily used by Luna Lovegood for her guided and accelerated studies. Quinn West's Compendium of Herbs and Magical Creatures in the Hands of Elliot was updated every year when he returned home, which allowed the potion enthusiast to continue learning whenever he had the time. His book of charms and spells for daily use had become one of Miss Rosie's favorite reads because of the sheer brutal practical nature of the included charms. While his personal tips on occlumency were nowhere near Alan D. Badley's masterpiece of guides, George still cherished the writings that Quinn sent him from time to time. Leah's little diary, which updated itself with tidbits from various branches of magic, allowed her to hold conversations with people from many walks of magic, earning her the reputation of being a well-versed, knowledgeable person all over the globe. Currently, he was jotting down one of the many theories of arithmancy that Quinn had recently researched upon. As he penned the last sentence of the document, Quinn heard a familiar chime. Quinn looked up to see a face that surprised him. The person in front of him wasn't one he expected to visit his office. Mr. Malfoy, he said, identifying his guest. What a surprise for you to visit my office. How may I help you? Draco Malfoy was a slender boy with sleek white blonde hair, cold gray eyes, a pale complexion, and rather sharp, pointed, aristocratic features. The fourth-year Slytherin, like many others, gazed at his office in wonderment and curiosity. It was only after the Malfoy heir was satisfied with his observations that he looked at Quinn. Stone gray eyes met cold gray ones as Quinn smiled at his junior. Please sit, Mr. Malfoy. I must say I wasn't expecting you to visit me anytime soon. Seeing you here makes me as curious as it makes me happy. Draco sat down on the chair and stared at Quinn for a while. The Malfoy heir had been educated about the West family. As such, before talking, Draco was cautious about his words. I have something I want to commission, started Draco, getting to the point. Draco reckoned that if he got down to brass tacks, the chances of offending Quinn would be the lowest. A commission, you say, said Quinn. He set aside his documents as someone like Draco deserved his full attention. Go ahead. What do you want me to make for you? From time to time, Quinn would take in some jobs of creating trivial things for students. Draco took out a parchment from his robes and handed them to Quinn, who opened it to look at neat and blocky handwriting. Ah, sighed Quinn internally as he read the contents. On the parchment, Draco had written two simple quotes. The first, support Cedric Diggory, the real Hogwarts champion. The second, Potter stinks. Below those quotes was a surprisingly neat drawing of the upper part of a Hogwarts robe, and a badge on the lapel area was a badge that read Potter Stinks. A badge that switches between these two quotes. Huh? sighed Quinn as he placed the parchment on the desk. Er, yeah, replied Draco, surprised that Quinn had understood without the need of an explanation. I'm sorry, Mr. Malfoy, but I have to refuse this job. Huh, why? said Draco, exclaiming at the direct refusal. Is it because of Potter? You don't want to offend the golden boy. Are you afraid of his mudblood mother? Draco looked at Quinn with a look of disgust. Quinn stared at his client and didn't take any offense on comment or the derogatory term. Instead, he looked at Draco as if he was a child throwing a tantrum. He waited for a moment before speaking. It isn't that I don't want to offend Harry Potter or Professor Potter. Well, I would prefer it if I don't offend anyone, but that's not the reason I'm refusing the job. Then why? asked Draco, feeling suspicious. Mr. Malfoy, the aim behind the Triwizard Tournament is to promote international relations, and unfortunately, Mr. Potter is a Hogwarts champion, he leaned forward. What do you think would happen when the foreign delegation sees around half of the school sporting these badges? The reputation of our school would be dragged through the mud in front of the outsiders. Draco wanted to retort with a snippy comment but Quinn cut him off as he wasn't finished. I have a few very good friends in Slytherin, Mr. Maul, Foy. The sudden statement made Draco confused as he couldn't see how it was relevant. From them, I know how Slytherin operates. No matter what happens between the members of the house, it doesn't get out. Outside of the walls of the house, no matter what the relation, the house remains united. Strength through unity. Draco blinked in astonishment at Quinn's sudden knowledge of his house. He, of course, knew about the rules inside Slytherin. It didn't matter if two Slytherin students hated each other from the bottom of their hearts. 
they would have each other's back outside the walls of the common room. The rule was one of the rules that no Slytherin broke, and on some level, it was more prevalent than the pure-blood dogma. It's because of that practice that the Slytherin house doesn't get overwhelmed by the three other houses, who think you're slimy snakes. Right now, Hogwarts needs that. To Bow Battens and Durmstrang, we aren't Ravenclaw, Slytherin, Gryffindor, or Hufflepuff. To them, we're just Hogwarts. Any negative action from one house will reflect on all of us. Any positive action from one house will benefit us all. Right now, we need to see ourselves as Hogwarts students, not house students, and that's why I'm not going to accept this request of yours. Draco, who sat in front of him, stared at the parchment he had brought. He hadn't thought the conversation would go this way. He expected Quinn to either accept his request or outright reject it because of their strained relationship. He wasn't expecting Quinn to spring out Slytherin house ideology to refuse the request, and even though his request had been denied, Draco felt proud because of how Quinn described Slytherin's house standing against the other three houses. I won't stop you from pursuing your plan if you take it to someone else. It's your prerogative to do whatever you want, but I'll not be taking any part in it. So you're saying that I need to be all chummy to Potter, asked Draco, not enthusiastic about it. Of course not. Just like in Slytherin, you just need to act like you have no problems with Mr. Potter. Forget that. You two don't run in the same circles, so you simply need to move on with your life. Since Quinn had ever met Draco, he had never disliked him. Quinn saw him as the child he was, a child raised by parents who looked down on anyone but purebloods and grew up in a circle that held the same beliefs. Hogwarts should have been where Draco got acquainted with different ideologies, but the system put him into Slytherin, and thus the cycle continued. The system that should have promoted growth is now hindering it, a system flawed to its core, thought Quinn. I... Draco didn't know how to reply. He felt embarrassed because of his motives. If I may suggest something, Mr. Malfoy, said Quinn, a plan forming in his head. Huh? uttered Draco in confusion, but that only made Quinn smile more. Two days later, Harry, Ivy, and Hermione walked into the Great Hall for breakfast. Since Harry had become the fourth champion, the Golden Squad hadn't been having a good time. Ron had left them. The Hufflepuffs gave Harry glaring looks whenever he passed them by. Slytherins snickered at them. Ravenclaw also looked at Harry with judgmental eyes. They thought that today would be no different, and outside Gryffindor, Harry, and through association, Ivy and Hermione would have to face the pointed looks and whispers for another day. Harry clicked his tongue when he saw someone walk towards him with a big smirk on his face. I'm not in the mood, Malfoy, growled Harry. Draco, along with a couple of Slytherins, were walking towards them. When Draco and others were close enough, they noticed something, each and every one of them wearing a large badge on the front of their robes. They saw that they all bore the same message, in luminous yellow letters that burnt brightly on a black background. Support Cedric Diggory, Hogwarts champion. The message vanished to be replaced by another one, which glowed white on a light blue background. Support Fleur Delacour, Beau Baton champion. Once again, the message turned. Now it glowed gold on a brown background. Support Victor Crumb, Durmstrang champion. Harry felt irritated as he knew that given Draco, he wasn't going to be on the badge, or if he was, then it was going to be something insulting, and his eyes twitched when the badge once again changed. Support Harry Potter, Hogwarts champion. Ivy, Hermione, and Harry's eyes widened when they saw the latest red on gold. They waited to see if something would happen, but nothing did, as the batch continued to cycle between four. Draco stepped close to Harry and smirked. Potter, you have to realize that I'm better than you. I'm up here, he said, putting his right hand near their head level, and you are here, down below. His left hand went as down as it could go. We're on entirely different levels. It's a pity that we have to tolerate you as our representative, he patted Harry's shoulder before scoffing. You better not embarrass us, Potter. With that, Draco placed three badges in Harry's hand, which the boy who lived grabbed because of the suddenness of all of this. Harry could only watch in stunned silence as Draco and his Slytherin buddies walked away, leaving him very confused. What the hell? 
Quinn West, MC. This year's theme is international relations, huh? Draco Malfoy, Slytherin, pretending to have raised above conflict. Harry Potter, fourth champion, things aren't going his way. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 147, Buzzing of an Annoying Bug. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at publion.com slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan Lowe. I know I'm productive and all, but they can't just foist all of this stuff on me. I'm a busy man for magic's sake, grumbled Quinn, making his way to the dungeons. He had just exited charms class when McGonagall cornered him out of the classroom and handed him a task. It's my only free break. I'm bloody booked for the rest of the day, he said, taking a turn. He could finally see his destination. However, when he had been within an earshot of the room, he heard a voice yelling out in a tone that was as unpleasant as nails scratching against a chalkboard. Antidotes! You should all have prepared your recipes by now. I want you to brew them carefully, and then we will choose someone that will try one. Quinn peeked inside from the classroom's door. Snape was looking over his class. His students looked visibly uncomfortable. Aha! So that's how everyone looks in Snape's class, huh? Thought Quinn, feeling the vibe oozing out of the room. Quinn never felt it while in class as he was busy brewing potions and doing his homework. He stood there and enjoyed everyone looking super uncomfortable for a few more seconds before knocking on the dungeon door, shattering the painful silence. He entered the classroom and made his way to Snape's desk. Yes, Mr. West, said Snape curtly. Good afternoon, Professor. I'm supposed to take Mr. Potter upstairs, said Quinn, smiling, as he turned his face towards the class. Harry was looking at him, with his sister Ivy and Hermione sitting behind him. He turned back, to look up at Snape, who stared down at him. There was no joy on his face or any delight in his eyes. The man looked like he had just come out of Azkaban. Potter has another hour of potions to complete, said Snape coldly. He will accompany you when this class is finished. I am aware of that, sir, but he is needed upstairs, replied Quinn, matching eyes with Potion Master. All the champions are being summoned up to take photographs for the press release. From what I have been made aware of, Mr. Bagman and Mr. Couch, along with the Daily Prophet team, have already arrived, so I think it's of priority that Mr. Potter gets up there. Harry, on his seat, looked both glad and uncomfortable. He was more than happy to exit the potion class, but he wished Quinn wouldn't have told them details. He glanced to his right to look at Ron, who was sitting with Dean Thomas. Very well, Snape snapped. Potter, leave your things here. I want you back down here later to test your antidote. Actually, Mr. Potter, bring your things along, interjected Quinn, directly addressing Harry. They want to see you in your school attire, book bag, and everything. Very well, said Snape. Potter, take your bag and get out of my sight. Quinn ignored Snape's tone and words and moved back to the door. He saw Harry swung his bag over his shoulder, got up, and headed for the door. Now that wasn't pleasant, was it, Harry? chuckled Quinn when they were out of earshot of the classroom. His mood was worse than usual. Did something happen? I don't know, replied Harry, looking down at the floor as he walked. That git is always in a bad mood. Ugh, why does he have to be so nasty to everyone? Hmm, I have no idea, answered Quinn. No way Quinn was going to explain to him that Snape pinned after his mother. Harry looked up from the ground and turned to glance at Quinn. Out of all the students he had seen interact with Snape, Quinn was the only one who looked comfortable doing so. Other than him, no one wanted to have a prolonged conversation with Snape. His eyes caught the badge on Quinn's robe as it turned from Crumb's name to his. You made those. Hmm? Quinn glanced at Harry and then followed his eyes to the badge on his lapel. That I did. You like them? Yeah, I saw the AID mark on the back, said Harry, putting his hand into his pocket, feeling his own badge. He looked up and then asked what he wanted to know. But Malfoy has been distributing these. Why? Mr. Malfoy was the one who came up with the idea, answered Quinn. I suggested some changes and produced them. I offered to take on the distribution, but he wanted to do it on his own. I guess he's doing fine, 
given that almost all students have a badge. Did Malfoy really come up with this? Quinn chuckled in reply. I won't lie, Harry. Mr. Malfoy had come in with different motivations, but he had this badge in hand when he left, so we can say that all's well that ends well. If you say so, said Harry heavily as they climbed up the stairs to the ground floor. What do they want photos for again? The information about the Triwizard Tournament is going to be published in the papers and magazines. You and the other champions are going to be interviewed and photographed for the articles. Great, said Harry dully. Exactly what I need. More publicity. Harry, you're already in the tournament. Lamenting your luck and feeling down about it isn't going to do you any good. You're already chosen as a champion, so I would personally suggest that you own it. I'm sure someone must have already told you about this, but you're now representing Hogwarts. To see one of our champions looking down and unenthusiastic all the damn time isn't something you want to show to outsiders. They will look down on you and take advantage of you. I'm assuming you don't want that. If I was in your place, I wouldn't want that. Do you? Would you want to be in my place? Asked Harry, staring at the guy who scored the highest in the entire school, who was undefeated in dueling, who was a prefect, who owned his own unique thing inside Hogwarts, and had saved him from getting kidnapped. Hmm, he thought about the question before answering. If the circumstances were different, I probably would have entered my name. I don't care much about the rewards, but I would love to have the range of freedom that a champion gets during the year. Exemption from sitting in the classes is something beneficial to someone like me. They reached their destination, so Quinn turned to Harry and gave him one last free piece of advice. Move on, Harry. You might not like it, but you're the boy who lived. You will be expected to act and perform a certain way. So pull yourself together, because you have a long year in front of you. Harry heard what Quinn was talking about, and even though he couldn't wrap his head around it immediately, he nodded. Good, let's go in, said Quinn, opening the door and nudging the boy champion into the room. They entered a reasonably small classroom. Most of the desks had been pushed away to the room's back, leaving the rooms half empty. Three of the desks, however, had been placed end-to-end -end in front of the blackboard and were covered in velvet fabric. Five chairs had been set behind the velvet-covered desks. Ludo Bagman was sitting in one of them, talking to a lady they had never seen before in Hogwarts who was wearing magenta robes. Victor Crum was standing moodily in a corner as usual. He wasn't talking to anyone. Cedric and Fleur were having a conversation. Fleur looked much happier than Quinn had seen her so far. She sometimes moved her head back to let her long silver hair catch the light. A paunchy man, holding a large black camera that was smoking slightly, was watching Fleur out of the corner of his eye. Bagman suddenly spotted Harry, got up quickly, approaching him. Ah, here he is, the fourth champion. Come in, Harry, come in. There's nothing to worry about. It's just a wand-weighing ceremony. The rest of the judges will arrive here in a moment. Wand-weighing? Harry repeated nervously, but he seemed much better than before they entered. We have to check that your wands are fully functional, you know, as they're your most important tools in the tasks ahead, said Bagman. The expert's upstairs now with D, Umbledore. And then, there's going to be a little photo shoot. This is Rita Skeeter, he added, gesturing toward the witch in magenta robes. She's going to write a little article about the tournament for the Daily Prophet. Maybe not that little Ludo, said Rita Skeeter, her eyes on Harry. Her hair was set in elaborate and curiously rigid curls that contrasted oddly with her light-jawed face. She wore jeweled spectacles. The thick fingers clutching her crocodile-skin handbag ended in two-inch nails, painted crimson. I wonder if I could have a little word with Harry before we start, she said to Bagman, but still staring at Harry. He is the youngest champion, you know, to add a bit of color? Certainly, cried Bagman. That is, if Harry has no objection? Er, said Harry. Lovely, said Rita Skeeter, and in a second, her scarlet taloned fingers grabbed Harry's upper arm in a surprisingly firm grip and she was about to steer him out of the room, but stopped when she glanced upon the student beside Harry. Quinn? Quinn West? She gasped. Her hand released Harry's arm, and like a hawk seeing her prey, she swapped near Quinn, staring at him with a starry-eyed look. Hmm, yes, 
Quinn looked at the woman in front of him. Miss Skeeter, was it? What can I do for you? Outside, Quinn was his usual calm self, but inside, he felt like publicly clicking his tongue and making a face. He held it inside, though. She has recognized me? Was I photographed somewhere? Or she just remembers my face, thought Quinn. The one who represented the West family outside was Laia, while George and Quinn remained out of the limelight. But there were times when he and George would go to official events, which were sometimes photographed. In those events, Quinn would try his best to not get photographed, but it seemed Rita knew his face enough to recognize at first glance. It's so rare to see a West. I must take this chance, she harped as if others weren't there at all. I would like to interview you before we start. Bagman and Harry looked at Rita. They couldn't believe the woman's thick skin. She had just asked Harry for a short interview, but now she had jumped ships and targeted Quinn. Quinn's eyes flashed for a second as he thought about his answer. After a few seconds, he answered, I don't mind. Marvelous, exclaimed Rita. She grabbed Quinn's arm and pulled him out of the room, opening another that was nearby. We don't want to be in there with all that noise, she said. Let's see. Ah, yes, this is nice and cozy. It was a broom cupboard, Quinn stared at her. Or we can go inside that classroom, said Quinn, pointing towards a door opposite to the broom cupboard. He didn't wait for Rita to object or reply and walked to the door, put his hand on the knob, silently unlocked it, and entered the room. Inside, he pulled out a desk and set two chairs, one on each side. He sat down and looked at Rita, who stood near the door. Miss Skeeter, please do sit. I'm sure you will want to hurry with the tournament press release starting soon, said Quinn, gesturing to Rita to sit down. The journalist didn't waste a single moment and sat down in front of Quinn with a swift speed that would put the nimblest of people to shame. She unsnapped her crocodile skin handbag and pulled out a handful of candles, which she lit with a wave of her wand and magicked into midair so that they could see what they were doing. You won't mind, Quinn, if I use a quick quotes quill? It leaves me free to talk to you normally. Rita Skeeter's smile widened. Quinn counted three gold teeth. She reached again into her crocodile bag and drew out a long acid green quill and a roll of parchment which she stretched out between them on a crate of Mrs. Scour's all-purpose magical mess remover. She put the tip of the green quill into her mouth, sucked it for a moment with apparent relish, then placed it upright on the parchment, where it stood balanced on its point, quivering slightly. Quinn smiled in return, leaned forward, and gently snatched the yee, long acid green quill out of Rita's hand. Wah! said Rita, about to ask what Quinn was doing, but her words died in her mouth when Quinn snapped the quill in half. I will be straight with you, Miss Skeeter, said Quinn, raising his eyes to look at Quinn. The smile on his face had changed. Now the corners of his lips were barely raised to form a very faint smile. You will not be writing anything about me. Not a single word about Quinn West or the Wests in general will be published in the Daily Prophet or any other newspaper that you write for under aliases. Rita giggled and took out another quick quotes quill of her bag. She performed the same ritual as before she began speaking. Testing. My name is Rita Skeeter, Daily Prophet reporter. Quinn looked down quickly at the quill. The moment Rita Skeeter had spoken, the green quill had started to scribble, skidding across the parchment. Attractive blonde Rita Skeeter, 43, whose savage quill has punctured many inflated reputations. Lovely said Rita Skeeter, yet again, and she ripped the top piece of parchment off, crumpled it up, and stuffed it into her handbag. Now she leaned toward Quinn and said, So, Quinn, what do you have to say about the life of a child of the West family? Quinn's eyes remained on the quill, and even though he wasn't speaking, it was dashing across the parchment, and in its wake he could make out a new sentence. A charming face, arrogant expression of a spoiled upbringing, a look that stares down on people as if regarding them as mere insignificant fleas. Quinn ignored the quill and the writing. He reached into his pockets and took out a playing card with a black and gold back and set it down on the desk. Miss Skeeter, I don't care what you write about anyone. It could be as fake as your golden teeth. And I wouldn't bat an eye. As long as it isn't about my family or me, I honestly don't care. However, if you write about me, you won't enjoy what comes afterward. 
he gently flipped the card, and instead of it being a number or a face card, what emerged was an image of a water beetle. Seeing the picture of the water beetle on the card made Rita freeze. Her wide, closed mouth smile cramped immediately. You're at the top of your game, probably one of the most celebrated names in the business, said Quinn tapping his finger near the card. You, at some level, have become a household name. It would be an absolute shame if all that hard work. The card was turned over, and instead of the black and gold back, there was a squashed water beetle with red blood in the background. Was crushed in an instant, turned to dust, forgotten with time, as you are isolated in a dark cell with some not-so-colorful jailers. You wouldn't want that, right? Rita had gone stark white and very still. She, with a slight tremble in her eyes, stared at Quinn with fear evident all over. Her quill had gone limp, noiseless, with the tip just hovering over the parchment. What do you want? she asked, her fingertips white from clutching her crocodile skin bag. If her identity as an illegal animagus was released to the ministry, she would be hunted by the Aurors quicker than she could write her own name. I don't like repeating myself, Miss Skeeter, he said, his face expressionless. This will be the last time, so listen carefully. I don't want to see any article related to me or anyone I am connected to. If you do that, your naughty little secret will remain hidden, and if we're lucky, you and I will never see each other again. Understood? Rita wordlessly nodded, and Quinn waved his hand over the card for it to change back to a standard playing card. Let's return, shall we? I don't want to miss the ceremony. Quinn stood up, pocketed the card, and walked towards the door. But before he exited, he turned and warned, Miss Skeeter, if I see you fluttering around, getting your career ruined will be the last thing you will have to worry about, so be careful if you do visit Hogwarts. Not giving her another look, Quinn exited the four room towards the previous room to witness the weighing of the wand ceremony. Quinn West, MC, asserting control, schooling the troll. Harry Potter, fourth champion, has been having a few stressful days. Rita Skeeter, journalist, water beetles are quite annoying. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 148, How a West Closes a Deal. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by editor. Glad to have put Rita Skeeter in her place. Quinn walked back into the room. He glanced to his right to see the champion sitting in chairs near the door. Turning his eyes to the front, Quinn saw the five judges. Igor Karkaroff, Olymp Maxime, Bartamius Crouch Sr., Ludo Bagman, and Albus Dumbledore sitting on a velvet-covered table. Glancing to his left, he noticed Rita Skeeter settle herself down in a corner. He saw her slip the parchment out of her bag again, spread it on her knee, suck the end of the quick quotes quill, and place it once more on the parchment. Her professionalism fascinated Quinn. It was impressive how quickly Skeeter bounced back and was back to normal. Just as he promised, Quinn didn't stop her from writing, as it wasn't about him or his close ones. He silently walked to another wall and stood close to it, choosing not to lean against it. May I introduce Mr. Ollivander? said Dumbledore, from his place at the judge's table and talking to the champions. He will be checking your wands to ensure that they are in good condition before the tournament. Quinn looked around and with mild surprise saw an old wizard with large, pale eyes standing quietly by the window. Quinn had met Ollivander once before. He was the wand maker from whom Quinn had bought his own wand all those years ago in Diagon Alley. His presence sure is feeble, thought Quinn. He overlooked the wand maker when he entered the room. Mademoiselle Delacour, could we have you first, please? said Ollivander, stepping into the empty space in the middle of the room. Fleur Delacour swept over to Mr. Ollivander and handed him her wand. Hmm, he said. He twirled the wand between his long fingers like a baton, and it emitted a number of pink and gold sparks. Then he held it close to his eyes and scrutinized it. Yes, he said quietly, nine and a half inches, inflexible, rosewood, containing, dear me. A lock of hair from the head of a vila, provided Fleur. One of my grandmothers. Part vila, bullshit, thought Quinn. 
There were no male vilas in existence, and as such a daughter born from a vila was a vila, and not a part vila like in the original works. Like her mother and grandmother, Fleur Delacour was a full vila and not some illogical quarter vila as had been written by the Duchess of Magic. Yes, said Ollivander, yes, I've never used vila hair myself, of course. I find it makes for rather temperamental wands, however, to each his own, and if this suits you. Quinn turned his gaze to Fleur's silver hair, and the fact that her hair when she grew up could be used as a component of a magical focus fascinated him much. House elf blood, vila hair, goblin heart, dwarf bone, listed Quinn in his mind. So many intelligent and humanoid races with a part of their body that can be used as a magical focus. He looked down at his hand and clenched it briefly before opening it to see the blood which had been pushed back return to his palm. Human blood had some magical properties, but not enough to use as a magical focus. No part of the human body had enough magical characteristics. It made him wonder how his magic would have been if he was from a different race. If I was a Vila, could my hair be used as an internal focus? If I was from a race connected deeper to magic than a human, how would my magic have turned out, he thought. He shook his head. He liked himself as a human, and there was no use in thinking about his race. Ollivander ran his fingers along with the wand, apparently checking for scratches or bumps. Then he muttered, Orchidius! And a bunch of flowers burst from the wand tip. Very well, very well, it's in fine working order, said Ollivander, scooping up the flowers and handing them to Fleur with her wand. Mr. Diggory, you are next. Fleur sat back to her seat, smiling at Cedric as he passed her. Ah, now this is one of mine, isn't it? said Ollivander with much more enthusiasm. Cedric handed over his wand. Yes, I remember it well. Containing a single hair from the tail of a magnificent male unicorn, must have been seventeen hands, nearly gored me with his horn after I plucked his tail. Twelve and a quarter inches, ash, pleasantly springy. It's in fine condition. Do you take care of it regularly? Polished it last night, said Cedric, grinning. Harry, who was among the champions, looked down at his own wand. He could see finger marks all over it. He gathered a fistful of the robe from his knee and tried to rub it clean surreptitiously. Several gold sparks shot out of the end of it. Fleur Delacour gave him a very patronizing look, and he desisted. Ollivander sent a stream of silver smoke rings across the room from the tip of Cedric's wand, pronounced himself satisfied, and then said, Mr. Crumb, if you please. Victor Crumb got up and slouched, round-shouldered and duck-footed, toward Ollivander. He thrust out his wand and stood scowling, with his hands in the pockets of his robes. Hmm, said Ollivander. This is a Grigorovich creation unless I'm mistaken. A fine wandmaker, though the styling is never quite what I, however. He lifted the wand and examined it minutely, turning it over and over before his eyes. Yes, hornbeam and dragon heartstring, he shot at Crumb, who nodded. Rather thicker than one usually sees, quite rigid, ten and a quarter inches. Avis! The hornbeam wand let off a blast like a gun, and several small twittering birds flew out of the end and through the open window into the watery sunlight. Good, said Ollivander, handing Crumb back his wand. Which leaves us, Mr. Potter. Harry got to his feet, and from the corner of his eyes he could see Quinn. He recalled the words the Ravenclaw had said to him. The fourth champion squared his shoulders, lifted his chin straight before confidently walking past Crumb to Ollivander. He handed over his wand. Ah, yes, said Ollivander, his pale eyes suddenly gleaming. Yes, 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 I remember it well. Harry could remember it too. He could remember it as though it had happened yesterday. Four summers ago, on his eleventh birthday, he had entered Ollivander's shop with his parents and Ivy to buy a wand. Ollivander had taken his measurements and then started handing him wands to try. Harry had waved what felt like every wand in the shop until, at last, he had found the one that suited him, one that was made of holly, measured eleven inches long, and contained a single feather from the tail of a phoenix. Ollivander had been very surprised that Harry had been so compatible with this wand. Curious, he had said, curious, and not until Harry asked what was curious had Mr. Ollivander explained that the phoenix feather in Harry's wand had come from the same bird that had supplied the core of Voldemort's. His parents hadn't been happy to hear that particular piece of information. 
They had made Ollivander show Harry some more wands, but in the end, Harry had come out of the shop with the Holly Phoenix Feather Wand. Harry had been forbidden to share this piece of information with anybody, and he was okay with that order, as he was very fond of his wand, and as far as Harry was concerned, its relation to Voldemort's wand was something it couldn't be helped. However, Harry really hoped that Ollivander wasn't about to tell the room about it. Harry had a funny feeling that Rita Skeeter might just explode with excitement if he did. Ollivander spent much longer examining Harry's wand than anyone else's. Eventually, however, he made a fountain of wine and handed it back to Harry, announcing that it was still in perfect condition. Thank you, said Dumbledore, standing up at the judge's table. You may. Now, now, Albus, interrupted Ollivander. We have another student among us. How about I examine his wand first before you dismiss all of us? Ollivander turned to his right, and with a smile in his pale eyes, he said, Mr. West, please bring your wand to me. I will check it before I leave. Everybody in the room looked at the lone non-champion student in the room. The eyes of Bartimius Crouch Sr. and Ludo Bagman widened when they heard how Ollivander addressed the boy. They almost snapped their necks from the speed they turned their heads to look at the boy, who was suddenly revealed to be from the West family. Quinn acted as if he didn't notice the looks of the others. He shook his head towards the wand maker with a smile. As much as I would like my wand to get examined by you, Mr. Ollivander, unfortunately, I don't have my wand with me. Dumbledore, who had gotten up from his chair, looked at Quinn in shock and surprise. Mr. West, you don't have your wand with you. The headmaster couldn't believe that Quinn, Quinn West in particular, didn't have his wand with him. Quinn shifted his robes to reveal the left side of his trousers to show that the wand holster he usually magically merged with his clothes there was missing. Yes, headmaster, chuckled Quinn at Dumbledore's surprise. As strange it might seem, today, Professor McGonagall went to me just enough that I forgot my wand holster in my book bag. I removed it for our potions class. As, according to Professor Snape, it isn't a place for wand waving. He turned to Ollivander and performed a short head bow. I will visit you in the summer, Mr. Ollivander. We can go over my wand then. Quinn, of course, had thought of the possibility of his wand being asked for a friendly inspection, so he had purposely left his fake wand and holster in his book bag behind in his office. I see, said Dumbledore slowly. You may go back to your lessons now, or perhaps it would be quicker just to go down to dinner as classes are about to end. Feeling that he had diverted his wand situation well, Quinn took one step forward, but the man with the black camera jumped up and cleared his throat. Photos, Dumbledore, photos, cried Bagman excitedly. All the judges and champions, what do you think, Rita? Er, yes, let's do those first, said Rita Skeeter, whose eyes were upon Harry again. And then perhaps some individual shots. Quinn stayed put and decided to stay still and wait for the event to end, but it turned out that was a mistake. The photographs took a long time. Madame Maxime cast everyone else into shadow wherever she stood, and the photographer couldn't stand far enough back to get her into the frame. Eventually, she had to sit while everyone else stood around her. Karkaroff kept twirling his goatee around his finger to give it an extra curl. Crumb, whom Quinn would have thought would have been used to this sort of thing, skulked, half-hidden, at the back of the group. The photographer seemed keenest to get Fleur at the front, but Rita Skeeter kept hurrying forward and dragging Harry into greater prominence. Then she insisted on separate shots of all the champions. At last, they were free to go. Quinn stepped outside of the room, stretching his slightly tired legs from standing still for too long. He wanted to go to his office and resume his work, but there was one thing he wanted to accomplish, the reason he had not left after delivering Harry for the press release. He eyed the blue-eyed, blonde man with rosy skin whose once athletic build had gone to seed. It was akin to a sack of potatoes now. Mr. Bagman, he called out, stepping near the ex-Quidditch athlete. Ludovic, Ludo Bagman turned, and his eyes widened in surprise when he came across Quinn standing behind him. The now ministry employee knew what the child represented, so even though he was tired from the lengthy session, he greeted him with a smile. Quinn, was it? What can I do for you? Walk with me, said Quinn, 
and without waiting for a reply, he started walking. Ludo blinked a couple times but fell into step with Quinn, already under the influence of Quinn's momentum and rhythm. Mr. Bagman, if I'm correct you, I'll be part of the judging panel for the tournament, correct? Ah, yes, along with the headmasters and Mr. Crouch. Hmm, and you will also be hosting said tasks, correct? Er, yes. Be honest with me, Mr. Bagman, asked Quinn. Are you truly interested in hosting the tasks? Eh, I don't understand, replied Bagman. The head of Department of Magical Games and Sports shouldn't be here for the Triwizard Tournament, said Quinn. Bagman expected a no offense from him, but it didn't come. The tournament might sound like it comes under the jurisdiction of your department, but it doesn't. That made me wonder, what were you actually doing here? So I did some light investigation and found that you volunteered for the judging committee. He glanced at Bagman as he said, I found that very peculiar. Bagman, who saw the look in Quinn's eyes, gulped. Why? Do you think so? I mean, wouldn't it make anyone wonder why a head of a department that hasn't had a single big initiative other than the World Cup is suddenly becoming wildly interested in the Triwizard Tournament? Quinn spoke as if telling a story. But then everything cleared up when I found that you are in debt. Nay, crushing debt from the goblins. It became so apparent why you were here. Bagman almost tripped on his own feet when he heard Quinn. His debt had been a well-kept secret. Despite the goblins looking for him everywhere, he had been able to keep things under a hush. You definitely put in some effort in getting this job, didn't you? If Mr. Crouch had been the one in charge, I presume things wouldn't have been easy for you. A fact that not many people knew about Ludo Bagman was that he had given information about the Ministry to Death Eaters during the First Wizarding War. He had given information to the Death Eater unspeakable Augustus Rookwood, and after the Death Eaters fell, he had been put on trial for treason. The one who spearheaded the trial was none other than the then head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, Bartimius Crouch Sr. He had tried hard to put Bagman in Azkaban, but Ludo was cleared of all charges to Crouch's extreme annoyance. This was partly due to him being a famous Quidditch player. One witch within the jury stood up and congratulated Bagman for his rather impressive play in the previous Quidditch match, with the others cheering him. Ludo was never accused of his allegiance with Death Eaters again. I don't know what you're talking about, said Ludo, pulling a smile on his face, but couldn't hide the fact of how uncomfortable he was feeling right now. Of course, of course, I'm sure I'm just misinformed, said Quinn, nodding. But the fact remains that you're in soul-crushing debt, and you need a way to pay it back. To do so, you need money, which you are going to get by illegally betting on the tournament and stacking the odds in your favor. You'll manipulate the outcome to the best of your ability. Quinn suddenly stopped and fixed his eyes on Ludo Bagman, causing the man to stare into the stone-gray orbs. The thought that he was talking to a kid had exited his head ever since the start of the conversation. Mr. Bagman, I'm sure you realize what my family represents. I, right here and now, within a few minutes can, he snapped his fingers for a galleon to appear between his thumb and index finger, snap your debt out of existence like it was never there. It won't take me any effort to do so, and by the time you wake up tomorrow, you could have a letter from Gringotts reading that your debt has been cleared. Bagman's heart was beating loudly in his chest. The debt had been weighing on his head and chest ever since the goblins had cornered after the World Cup Finals. They had stunned him and stripped him down until he was completely nude to get their money back. He had been so shocked to find himself naked and in between a Death Eater raid after he got up that he decided to solve the problem by joining the judging panel and helping the Hogwarts champion win the tournament. When he found that Harry Potter had been chosen as the fourth champion, he thought his luck couldn't be better. Despite his reputation as the boy who lived, the 14-year-old champion didn't inspire much confidence in the underground betting scene, so he decided that he would help Harry Potter win the tournament and pocket the huge returns from his bettings. I can solve your problems, said Quinn with a depthless smile. All you have to do is to step inside after me. He gracefully raised his hand and pointed it to his side. Bagman's eyes followed Quinn's hand, and he saw a door. 
It was just like any other classroom doors in Hogwarts, but with just one difference. What do I have to do? asked Bagman. Quinn smiled and opened the door, inviting Bagman and stepping inside after him. The standard Hogwarts door was shut with an out-of-the-ordinary flat black plaque hanging snug against the door pane. In golden letters, the plaque read, 773H. Quinn West, MC, really stepping up his game, isn't he? Garrick Ollivander, wandmaker, thinks a lot about his work. Ludovic Bagman, under crushing debt, stepped into the deal of a lifetime. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 149, Seeking Help, Signing Crumb, Providing Help. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon and patreon.com.com. The link is also in the synopsis. The portrait door to the Gryffindor common room flung open on its hinges, and from the opening entered Harry Potter, the boy who lived, fourth champion. The 14-year-old boy was stark pale, white like a ghost, as if he had seen the most horrifying scene of his life. With a bead of sweat trailing down his forehead, he sat himself down in a corner, slumping in his seat, tapping his feet while looking at the floor with unblinking eyes. Ever since he had become champion, he had been attracting a lot of eyes no matter where he went, and it was something that he didn't enjoy because people at Hogwarts had just gotten used to his reputation as the boy who lived. Currently, though, he didn't care about the looks of others. He couldn't care less if someone glared or smiled at him. He didn't know how long he sat in his seat, but Hermione and Ivy had returned from their daily library visit. The two girls saw him sitting in the corner, his eyes haunted. What happened to you? asked Hermione upon reaching Harry's seat. Upon not getting an answer, Ivy pushed Harry's shoulder to get his attention, and it seemed to work when Harry trembled as he looked up with a surprised look on his face. What? We asked what happened to you, said Ivy. Wait, why are you looking like that? The two girls finally noticed the pale pallor of Harry's skin when he looked up at them, causing them to get worried. He only had one word in reply. Dragons. He recalled his trip with Hagrid, Four fully grown, enormous, vicious-looking dragons were rearing onto their hind legs inside an enclosure fenced with thick planks of wood. Roaring and snorting, torrents of fire shot into the dark sky from their open fanged mouths, fifty feet above the ground on their outstretched necks. There was a silvery blue one with long, pointed horns, snapping and snarling at the wizards on the ground. A smooth-scaled green one, who was writhing and stamping with all its might. A red one with an odd fringe of refined gold spikes around its face, which was shooting mushroom-shaped fire clouds into the air. And finally, a gigantic black one, more lizard-like than the others, nearest to them. At least thirty wizards, seven or eight to each dragon, attempted to control them, pulling on the chains connected to heavy leather straps around their necks and legs. Mesmerized, Harry looked up, high above him, and saw the eyes of the black dragon, with vertical pupils like a cat's, bulging with either fear or rage, he couldn't tell which. It was making a horrible noise, a yowling, screeching shriek. It's no good, yelled another wizard. Stunning spells on the count of three. Harry had seen each of the dragon keepers pull out their wand. Stupefy, they shouted in unison, and the stunning spells shot into the darkness like fiery rockets, bursting in showers of stars on the dragon's scaly hides. Harry watched the dragon nearest to them teeter dangerously on its back legs, its jaws stretched wide in a silent howl. Its nostrils were suddenly devoid of flame, though still smoking. Then, very slowly, the dragon fell. Several tons of sinewy, scaly black dragons hit the ground with a thud that Harry could have sworn made the trees behind him quake. The dragon keepers lowered their wands and walked forward to their fallen charges, each of which was the size of a small hill. They hurried to tighten the chains and fasten them securely to iron pegs, which they forced deep into the ground with their wands. A common Welsh, a Swedish short snout, a Chinese fireball, and the Hungarian horntail. Four lethal, pissed-off dragons, breathing fire in anger of captivity. He didn't know whether he was glad he'd seen what was coming or not. Perhaps this way was better. The first shock was over now. 
Maybe if he'd seen the dragons for the first time on the tee, ask day, he would have passed out cold in front of the whole school, but maybe he would anyway. Harry was going to be armed with his wand, which just now felt like nothing more than a narrow strip of wood against a 50-foot-high, scaly, spike-ridden, fire-breathing dragon, and he had to get past it, with everyone watching. How? The girls looked at each other, not knowing what to do. The thought of a dragon was terrifying to them, and that was when they weren't going to face them in a battle that might end in maiming, severe mutilation, or death. Harry, started Ivy, but Harry cut him off. He stood up from his seat, and suddenly he had a look of determination in his eyes. I'm going to him for help, he said. He was already enrolled as a champion. There was no going back. So the least he could do was take some steps to increase his survival. Him. Who do you mean? asked Hermione. Harry gave a brief side glance to Ivy, and the girl twin tilted her head in confusion, but the very next second, her eyes widened to the size of saucers. You mean him? Harry nodded. He is the best choice, isn't he? Well, he is. Skilled, said Ivy. She could suddenly feel the phantom sensation of walls clutching around her. But are you sure? This is big. He is going to ask for a lot. Mum can't help in the open. Dad isn't here, nor is Sirius here. Out of everybody, I think he's one good choice, isn't he? Said Harry, listing. Or we can just practice among ourselves. Hermione chimed in, catching up to the conversation. Harry turned to the brunette and asked, Do you know how to deal with a dragon? Well, not really, replied the smartest of the group. He will be able to help. Didn't you say that he's undefeated, pointed out Harry to his sister. Also, if I remember correctly, he defeated Cedric. Doesn't that make him the best person to go to? A person who defeated a champion could certainly help. If you say it like that. The points made sense to her, but the thought of Harry incurring a heavy debt worried Ivy. I would like to survive this instead of worrying what he would ask of me. Ivy still hesitated, but conceded in the end. All right, you can go to him for help. Good, nodded Harry while stepping forward. Where are you going? asked Ivy. To him. Now? said Hermione, looking at her watch. There wasn't much time for dinner. I would like to meet him as soon as possible, was Harry's reply as he made his way to the exit, prompting the two girls to follow after him. Quinn sat behind his desk gazing at the people sitting in front of him. What do you two think? He asked with a smile. A fun and productive proposal to spend your time at Hogwarts. You're going to be here for a while, so why not make it unique, something to remember and tell in the future as a story? Across him stood two people, one dressed in Durmstrang and the other in bow batons. Quinn turned to the Durmstrang student and smiled. Mr. Crumb, your time here will definitely be something we will remember. What do you think? Some Quidditch, while you're stuck here, doesn't sound bad, does it? The grumpy and taciturn champion, who had been grouchy the entire time he had been in Hogwarts, who had been extra irritable when Kari, his classmate, had escorted him to this office to meet some kid. He thought that it was going to be another person asking him for his signature. But now, as he sat here in this seat listening to the kid, Quinn West, talking about a Quidditch tournament, Crumb felt the happiest he had been ever since coming here. I will participate, he nodded. He was more excited to participate in this than he was to take part in the Triwizard Tournament. Quinn then turned to the other person, a boy, blonde, blue eyes, and asked the same question. What about you, Mr. DuPont? Would you like to lead a Bobatons team? Gail DuPont was the first guy from Bobatons that Quinn had talked to. He was a friendly and affable seventh-year student. I would be honored to. Qui, nin, smiled the French wizard. Excellent, smiled Quinn, pushing a thin stack of tev papers each towards the two people. This would be an elaborate thing, and he needed ample paperwork to keep track of things. Please sign these at the cross lines. This is some boilerplate stuff. You can read them if you want, notified Quinn, and it was true. He hadn't messed with any of the wording. Mr. Crumb, any other professional contract I should be aware of? Something that wouldn't allow you to play Quidditch on your own? He asked, knowing that, as Crum was a professional athlete, perhaps he could have some restrictions normal people didn't have. No, replied the Bulgarian. I was contracted to the national team. The negotiations with the clubs are still ongoing. I'm still free to play anywhere I want to. 
Good, that saves me legal trouble. The two new captains signed the contract for the Interschool Quidditch Tournament. Now, you don't have to worry about setting up teams right now, said Quinn, slipping the form into envelopes. I will announce the tournament after the first task, which is on November 24th. Thus, we are going to announce it on November 25th. That day, I will introduce the captains along with the rules. The official tournament will start on January 1st, so you will have an entire month to set things up and get in some training. He stood up from his seat, prompting the other two to do the same. It was nice meeting you two, he said, shaking their hands. I will keep in touch. Please look forward to this tournament. It's going to be something special. The two future captains exited the office feeling satisfied and excited about their future. Even Quinn was happy with how things were going. Things were running smoothly. Nevertheless, the tough part is yet to come, he said, groaning and stretching. He sighed. Setting up teams was easy. He just needed to choose captains and let them do all the work. So much of the logistics is left. As he walked to the red door in the glass wall, ready to get some magical work done, he heard a knock on his door. He turned back just in time to listen to the door chime ring in a clear, soothing melody. Oh my, he said in surprise and curiosity. I wasn't expecting you three to come here today. In front of him were the Potter twins and the smartest witch of her age. They were standing at his doorstep, one determined, one hesitant, and the last curiously looking around his office. Harry, Ivy, Miss Granger, how may I help you out today? Quinn asked as he moved away from the red door back to the bar stool behind his desk. Please, come in and have a seat. He sat on his own seat and waited for the three to settle down. He judged them from their current looks and body language and saw that all of them were pretty nervous. Something he found interesting, as the girls hadn't been anxious during their last visit. Do you know about the first task? asked Harry, deciding to be straight to the point. Yes, answered Quinn. Why? I just saw them near the forest, continued Harry, as Ivy and Hermione exchanged a look. As they were expecting, Quinn was aware of the first task, and from the looks of it, he knew about it before today. Ah, nodded Quinn with a smile. Magnificent creatures, aren't they? They are wonders of magic. In my opinion, their connection to magic is something to behold. So what do you want from me? I want to live, said the boy who lived. I don't want to die from getting burned to ashes by a dragon. And, Harry glanced at Ivy and Hermione before turning back to Quinn, I want you to teach me how to survive the dragon. Quinn stared at Harry for a second, a very long second, before replying. Sure, I can do that. The three clients blinked. They stared at Quinn, who looked like what he had said was no big deal. You will? asked Ivy, honestly expecting something more or just something. Yeah, it's all right. I don't consider myself a good teacher, but I think you will handle it just fine. What will you charge? asked the red he. D. She had experience. The usual charges apply. In exchange for my services, you owe me a favor of equal importance, answered Quinn, interlinking his fingers over the desk. I accept, declared Harry without hesitation. When do we start? Tomorrow, answered Quinn. I will have a schedule sent over to you. Build your day around that. I'm not going to adjust to yours. You're going to adapt to mine. Though I warn you, it is going to be tough. I'm not a great teacher because I don't have any patience for those who don't work hard. If the problem is me, I will change. But if you aren't going to put in the work, then you're not going to like me much for the next two weeks. Quinn had two students, if he could call them that, Eddie and Luna. Eddie worked quite well with Quinn because his best friend worked hard and hated to lose. Eddie's personality made sure that he kept on working hard, and thus, under Quinn's training, he had been able to get fit quite quickly. On the other hand, Luna wasn't as hard-working as Eddie, but because Quinn had tailor-made the learning that just for her, Luna was able to maintain consistent progress. As long as he was able to keep Luna interested, she would work and show good progress. However, unlike Luna, Quinn didn't have the time to, to tailor a regime to Harry, he didn't know how Harry learned or how quickly he learned, and with only a fortnight to the first task, Quinn didn't have time to build Harry an optimal learning path. Can we learn too? asked Hermione. The opportunity to learn from Quinn interested her a lot. Hmm, 
Quinn gave it a thought before nodding. As long as you don't cause a delay in Harry's progress, you and Ivy, if she desires, can watch. But no one else. After setting up more terms, the three left, leaving Quinn behind in his office. Another year, another request, he said. Ever since the first time Ivy Potter had entered his office along with Hermione Granger, he had provided the members of the Golden Squad the best help and solution he could provide. No matter what request they put in front of him, he offered a great solution to them. Sure, he asked them for something in return, but it was always just a token to make it seem that he wouldn't give them help for free. The only favor he had cashed in was from their break-in. He wasn't dense or ignorant. Every time Ivy Potter had entered this office, she exited with some form of information. He knew what he was doing when he provided them with the knowledge and how it helped them. As long as anyone from Golden Squad came to the AID office and him, Quinn was going to help them out. With their identity and fate, Quinn didn't mind helping them out. As long as it helped them along with Voldemort's death as the goal, or simply the progression of the plot, Quinn was more than happy to be of help. If Ron Weasley came into his office and read a request from a slip of parchment one day, Quinn would help him out as long as it didn't put him at a disadvantage. It's good they're cautious of me, muttered Quinn. It will keep their requests in check. He smiled, stood up, and walked to his workshop, ready to start his magical research. Quinn West was a busy wizard after all. A.N. Hello, people. Now, I've been seeing some comments saying that the chapters are shorter. It turns out that the statements are in fact true. Hear me out. I made a mistake, and that was to undersell my word count. I generally publicize that my chapters are 3K words long, because it's easy to write, and 3K sounds a good rounded number. But the truth is that before my little midterm break, I've been pumping out chapters which were closer to 3.5K than 3K. The recent few chapters have truly been 3K words chapters, and that might be the reason they seem short in comparison. Don't get me wrong, I've always aimed for 3K word chapters, but almost every time I write a chapter, it seems that whenever I reach that 3K line, my brain decides to get productive, and I end up with chapters that are over 3K. That was my in an analysis. Thank you for reading, Fiction Only Reader. Quinn West, MC. This is seriously going to be a hectic year. Harry Potter, fourth champion, the boy who lived wants to continue to live. Victor Crumb, Durmstrang champion, he didn't enter the tournament entirely of his own will, did he? If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 150, Troll's Eye, Best Allies Mirror. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at hatsframing.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor. The darkness of the Forbidden Forest's underworld looked quite different in Quinn's night vision. Everything was colored in shades of gray, the objects lacked details, yet his eyes were highly susceptible to movements. His other senses worked harder to compensate for the fact that his vision was incomplete. From his peripheral vision, Quinn noticed a mid-size acromantula crawl out of the bushes between the blackened trees, making soft clicking sounds from the faint rustle of leaves. Another attack? He wondered, ice crackling with a faint mist below his palm. He raised his arm up, a jagged ice spike floating along with it. The acromantula didn't seem to feel any fear in the face of the ice. Seeing the lack of reaction, Quinn's eye twitched and he sighed. He raised his arm straight above his head and shot the ice spike straight up into the air with loaded force. Instantly, a screeching scream sounded as a small-sized acromantula fell down just ahead of his feet. A thick rope of spider web attached from its spinneret was hanging above. If force isn't working, they're using brains, huh? I can respect that. The mid-size acromantula that was working as a distraction saw another spike manifest into existence and this time it felt fear. The spider leaped into the bushes and scurried away before Quinn could send a spike its way. He knelt on the floor, and with a pair of protective gloves adorning his hands, Quinn extracted some venom from the pincers and the already produced web silk from its spinneret. 
he didn't doubt obtaining one of the more unusual materials on the market. If this keeps going, I will soon have a hefty stock of this stuff. It had been a couple of weeks since he had started to explore the forest, and in all of his visits, Quinn had met Acromantulas every single time. Argog didn't have control over his children, at least not much as he liked to think. The flesh-eating magical spiders were hungry for human flesh, and Quinn's regular visits were simply too much of a temptation. After collecting the venom and silk, Quinn walked ahead, deeper into the forest. Within a minute of walking, treading between the trees, vines, and knee-length bushes, Quinn finally arrived at another region of the woods. His enlarged, dilated pupils and modified eyes reverted to their original state as he saw a stream of light illuminate a circular clearing. He knelt down just away from the edge and peered into the only area he had reached, which had natural sunlight hitting the ground. He looked at the reason behind the reason. Within the clearing were broken stumps, uprooted trees, grassless ground, skid marks ravaging the land, and within all of it he saw the residents of the great clearing. Among all of that, ferocious roars and grunts resounded as Quinn watched forest trolls, pale green skin, and straggly hair, armed with clubs crafted from uprooted trees. The twelve-foot-tall, muscular monstrosities savagely fought each other. They bashed their clubs against each other, earnestly trying to defeat their opponent. One of the trolls finally seemed to gain an advantage as he struck the other troll's clubs aside and raised his own club above his head before bringing down the sturdy clubs straight down on the head of the other troll. A loud crack filled with an area with a painful roar, causing Quinn to flinch. But the sound was just the start as a wave of more deafening roars pervaded the area. A horde of trolls sitting around the clearing, some of the tree logs, others on the ground, cheered at the fight's brutal conclusion. Damn, do they do this every day? Two times, he had watched the same scene two times. He had seen the forest trolls duking it out and both times he had left after observing them, not daring to enter the light. One troll took a barrage of spells from the twelve-year-old me, thought Quinn. I can incapacitate them quicker now, but a dozen of them? That doesn't. The danger was just too great. With no free water source near Quinn, he didn't have a magic that could use to wipe the trolls in one fell swoop. Fire could work, but the collateral damage would be too great. The area and power of magic weren't a problem. He could use some other elements with a lot of firepower, but the problem was control. He was good with the other elements, but the level of control that Quinn needed to eliminate the trolls without the risk of setting the forest on fire wasn't a level that he currently had. Fortunately, I have something I can use, he smiled, and his body covered in black camouflage turned invisible. He stood up, walked forward into the clearing. The reason he had returned two times was because of scouting. He had found the density of trolls inside the darkness was much denser than outside. If he wanted to get past this part of the forest, he had to go through the clearing. Even with his invisibility magic, the terrain of the forest was rough enough for Quinn to hide all the noise. The grassless ground was his safest choice. Step by step, he moved towards smack dab in the middle of the clearing. This reminds me of the chessboard, he thought, smiling. The risks are around the same, aren't they? Roar! His smile broke when he heard a roar from behind. Quinn turned to see a forest troll, larger than other of his kin, entering the clearing. His club seemed grander than others, ornated with various leathers and spiked with carved bones all around its surface. The new forest troll had spotted Quinn. How in hell, he thought, but the answer struck him like a bolt of lightning as he saw the troll's eyes. The green troll's eyes were an off-white color, a shade barely different from the white of the eyes. Quinn knew in his heart that it wasn't just abnormal eye color, but something magical. Trolls, like hags, possess rudimentary magic that in rare cases manifests in additional physical features. A tidbit of information about trolls popped up in his mind. It had been so rare that that information had been stuck in the corner of a page. It seemed it was something that was so rarely seen that it was barely notable enough to get printed in. One freaking book. He can see me. Something in his eyes can see me. What is it? Magic sight? Heat vision? or something entirely different. He tried to think of the reason, 
but almost as soon as the thought entered, it was forcibly squashed, as right now, Quinn's priorities were different. He had to get out of here as quickly as possible. His magic-aided mind worked overtime, and while he thought, the regular forest trolls stood up in confusion. They couldn't see Quinn, but their leader alerted them that there was an intruder here, and not just any intruder, they had a human among them. Trolls, just like their neighbors, Acromantulas, also loved human flesh, and they liked to eat the meat raw. Quinn finally thought of a solution, spurring a line in his mind. It was one line that he recalled from the original works. Anyone can speak, troll. All you have to do is point and grunt. So that's what he was going to do. If this doesn't work, I'm going to go on a rampage and run in the chaos. The magic started to leak out of Quinn. Invisible streams of magic rose up, populating the area around him. He closed his eyes and concentrated. The image, sound, scent, and feel were unmistakable in his mind. Quinn already had everything, and the magic was within him. Let's go. The forest trolls had all armed themselves with their clubs and bones. The white-eye leader pointed at the spot Quinn was standing, telling his kind who couldn't see Quinn's position. But before they could take a step closer, abruptly, a dominant roar shook the area. They saw a fifteen-feet-tall figure come running out of the woods. It was the same size as their leader, but it looked much wilder and more muscular than their leader. In, instead of a club, it had a dull, rusted sword in his hand, which he dragged across the ground, gashing the earth as he stomped forward. All trolls stepped back with their weapons clutched in their hands. They were scared of the newcomer's roar and size. The weapon, too, intimidated them. The dumb trolls had enough intelligence to gauge this one's intentions before charging in, the thought of the so-called invisible human. The leader troll, unlike his lesser kind, could see what was going on. He could see that the new troll was just some magic done by the human, as he was standing behind the new troll. It grunted to tell them the truth, but the new troll roared louder and raised his sword towards him, challenging him to a fight. The forest trolls grunted in joy, excited to see a fight. They were confused about who to follow, and a war would solve that problem. They sat down, slamming their clubs against the floor repeatedly, as in the tradition of forest trolls. Quinn behind the new troll smiled. His plan was working. Illusions sure are handy, he thought. Thankfully, these guys are dumb, so dumb. He had copied the leader troll, altering some features, making his creation more intimidating. The sword interacting with the ground leaving gashes? That was simply earth magic, emulating metal being dragged across the soil. The roars were sound magic, like the ones during his tri-wizard performance, something he had mastered. He roared and grunted, challenging the big bad troll to a brawl. If I win, I can walk out of here without arising suspicion, he thought and looked at the leader, who looked pissed. He had walked to the middle, with his bone spike club ready for attack. Oh, you big dummy, you're unlucky sighed Quinn with a smile. You might be big and a little special, but in the end, you're still a troll. The current me can wipe the floor of the twelve-year-old me. I could probably make him cry if I wanted, though that son of a bitch would probably try to pull something off. Quinn shook his head to stop himself from thinking off topic. So you're going down. Hard. Quinn decided to take on the role of the aggressive alpha troll and decided to make the first move. His illusion troll raised his blunt sword and ran forward to strike. On the other hand, he prepared a flesh-shredding curse in his hand, ready to shoot it when the metal made contact. With his special sight, the leader troll knew that the troll in front of him was a fake, so his troll brain decided to take the attack head-on. No defense was needed. Idiot. The rusted sword descended on the defenseless leader, and the moment the illusion met his corporal body, the troll's shoulder was shredded. It wasn't deep, but neither was it a shallow cut due to the tough troll skin. It was enough to send the leader into panic and shock. He grabbed his shoulder and raised his club for defense, but Quinn had already anticipated the actions. Can't let him rest. Need to keep attacking, thought Quinn and prepared a strong depulso. It wasn't a duo or maxima. Quinn never used those versions. They used language to gain the extra power, and he never used any words while casting magic. His spells resulted from his pure understanding of the magic and transcended the limit of chant-triggered magic. 
Even though he called it Depulso, it was at its essence a push spell whose upper power limit was decided upon Quinn's understanding and the amount of magic he put in. The illusion raised his foot and kicked the troll, and simultaneously the Depulso replication made contact, sending the leader to the floor. Wark! grunted the leader in pain and surprise. Wark! roared the illusion and raised his sword in a reverse grip, moving in for a stab. The leader was a tough and brawling adept troll as he rolled aside to avoid the sword, causing the ground where he was just before to be ravaged by Quinn's magic. Ch-ch, he dodged, thought Quinn clicking his tongue. But your opponent isn't a real troll. He is an illusion. A savage smile appeared on Quinn's fung. Ace, as he finished his thoughts, he can move faster. The illusion pulled out the heavy sword, which probably would have weighed a lot if real, out of the ground with an unnaturally swift speed, and brought it up slashed down again. The experienced leader, with a mind only for brawling, sent out a kick, tried to sweep the illusion's legs. Quinn scrunched up his face and made his illusion jump to avoid the sweep. He couldn't have the leader land even a single hit, which would take away the illusion. He could control his movement, but not the leader's. The illusion kicked the leader once in the shoulder, worsening the injury getting a howl from the leader. Quinn's troll took the chance and placed his foot on the leader's chest, holding him down. I won't kill you, but I can't have you interfering with me, thought Quinn. I'm sorry, really, really sorry. The sword was raised and slashed across the leader's eyes, spurting blood, causing howls, effectively blinding the leader, taking away his only gift. Rock! screamed the leader, clutching his eyes. Quinn's troll stepped back and grunted and roared at the smallest of the trolls among the troll horde. In a show of compassion and apology, Quinn ordered them to take care of the leader. Three smaller trolls lifted the leader up and took him away from the clearing into the darkness. The mournful screams eventually subsided, leaving Quinn alone with the remaining troll. The illusion walked away without saying a word to the others, stepping out of the clearing. And in darkness, Quinn erased the illusion and decided to end the day with this. Next time, I will move on, he decided, walking away from the forest troll inhabitants living in the forbidden forest. Barty Crouch Sr. returned to his home after a busy day at the ministry. He removed his coat and hat and hung them on the hangers, his eyes looking slightly confused and uncomfortable as he placed his hat on the hook. The man wasn't used to this particular action. Is work getting me? He sighed. Is my age getting to me? To think I would be tired just with this. This much was nothing in the old days. He chuckled in derision at his current situation. From the prestigious position of DMLE head to the head of international relations, how far he had fallen. All because my son decided that it was fine to join a dark lord, he sighed, and for a brief painful moment, the thought of his late wife flashed through his mind. I should check on how that idiot son of mine is doing. With his wand in hand, Crouch Sr. walked towards his son's room. He didn't know that Barty Jr. needed a new layer of imperious cast on him. But as he reached the staircase that led to his son's room, the father noticed that a room not used in the house had light coming from inside. Confused with this sight, Barty Sr. removed his foot from the stair step and walked towards the door with light across the edges. The owner's hand reached the doorknob, but before he could grab it, Barty Sr.'s eyes glazed over. He withdrew his hand and stood still in his spot with a blank look. Within seconds, clarity returned to Barty Sr. His eyes as he turned away from the room and the section of the house. He will be fine. No need to worry, he said, sighing. I need to fix myself a drink. But as he walked away, Barty Sr. turned his head back to look at the door his eyes shaking as if struggling against something, before he glazed over once again and became calm as if the tremor had been a lie. Inside the room left behind, still with light leaking through the gaps, sat two people, one thin and short with rat-like features, while the other a wrinkled and hideous baby. Wormtail, any news from Barty? asked the ugly baby. Yes, master, answered the calm man, matching eye with the ugly baby he called master. Barty says that the boy has been made aware of the dragons awaiting him for the first task. Rubus Hagrid took the boy and showed him the dragons. I see. What do you think of the boy, Wormtail? 
I wouldn't know, Master. The last time I saw Harry was when he was a year old. After that, I haven't had much contact with the Potter family, said Peter Pettigrew, but from what I've heard, he's like James. If that's true, then Harry Potter is brash, reckless, and popular, but I'm sure Lily must have given something of hers to the boy. Baby Mort stared at the follower who had brought him back with a cold gaze. His followers in his presence showed various behaviors. Worship, fear, happiness, nervousness, servitude, and all other kinds of emotions, but he never had seen calm indifference as he saw now. Tell me, Wormtail, why did you seek me in Albania? Peter glanced up from the internal ministry memos provided by the imperious Edbardi Sr. The ruin of the potters and their compatriots master. That's the reason I returned instead of leaving my previous life behind. Meaning that you didn't find me for my sake. That's something dangerous to admit, don't you think, Wormtail? No reason to lie now, master. You already went through my mind after we got you this body. Neither you nor I gain anything from me lying about my motives. Not that it matters, the destruction of potters is my main goal, and for you, it's a crucial step for your return to the crown of the wizarding world. What after that worm tale? What after I do kill the boy and with him Dumbledore's little annoying group? What are going you going to do then? Sometimes to achieve something, we have to lose something else, answered Peter looking at the burning fireplace. As much as I would like to finally rest at the end of the potters, I doubt you would allow that. So servitude in return for my revenge, that is the current plan. What makes you think I won't kill you when I'm done with you, Wormtail? Wormaddle chuckled. An absolutely fake and dull chuckle, as if the man had forgotten what it was like to laugh, causing Baby Mort's eyes to narrow a fraction. I don't know what the future holds, or what are your plans for me, Master? Currently, I simply yearn to see the lifeless eyes of James, Sirius, and Remus. Ask me the same question on that day. Maybe I will have an answer then. You're playing a dangerous game, said Baby Mort in his squeaky voice. The moment I turned up at your doorstep all those years ago, I was already part of the game, Master. It's just now I'm finally playing to my fullest, responded Peter, removing his eyes from the fireplace. I don't trust you, Wormtail. A wise decision, Master. The conversation between Master and Servant ended. The room regained its previous silence. Neither cared about each other, and both knew that fact well, and maybe it was because of that that they worked so well together. As long as their goals aligned, the threat of betrayal was not present, making the two each other's greatest allies. Quinwest, let's go. Real-life fighting game. Leader, Forest Troll, possess ED magical eyesight. Baby Mort, Voldemort, doesn't have the Cruciatus urge in his current form. Peter Pettigrew, Wormtail, has forgotten what it's like to laugh. Fiction-only reader, author, how did you like the fight? I will be switching things up in the future. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis.